Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 15th meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones, and as members' uh, papers are provided in digital format, you may see some of us using tablets uh, during the meeting, so that's what we're doing. Uh, with apologies uh, this morning from Alexander Stewart. Unfortunately, he can't be with us this morning. I move to agenda item one, Local Government and Scotland Financial Overview 2015-2016. The committee will take evidence on the Accounts Commission Report, Local Government and Scotland Financial Review 2015-2016. And I'm delighted to welcome this morning from the Accounts Commission, Ronnie Hines, Deputy Chair, Fraser McKinley, Controller of Audit, and uh, Martin McLaughlin from Audit Scotland, who is Senior Auditor. Can I invite the Deputy Chair to make a short opening statement? Thank you, Convener. I did have some uh, opening remarks prepared, but uh, the Committee will probably be pleased to hear that I'm not going to stick to those. I'll just make one or two brief observations and then devote time to the questions that you'll want to ask. Um, at the risk of stating the obvious, local government finance is exceedingly <laughs> complex, and I just say that because it's a kind of cautionary note to everything that we've said in the, uh, in the report. Um, and the reason that we've departed from our previous practice, which the committee will know has been to produce an annual overview report that covers not just local government finance, but other aspects of local government services, governance and so on, is precisely because it's so complex and we thought it would be better to try to devote some dedicated time and space to an exposition of some of the, um, the more obscure, if you like, but, but important aspects <coughs> of how local government is funded. And that's why we produce this report. And the timing is no accident either. And we think at this time of the year, the value of a piece of work like that that tries to shed some light on some of these issues in the context of the annual debate about how local government is funded and how the money is spent would be of greater use to the public and to the committee and other interested parties. So with that said, um, we're really just here to try to answer any questions the committee might have around the report. And we're more than happy to do that. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And we'll move to our first question from Graeme Simpson. Thanks, Convener. Um, you, you say in your um, summary, all councils face future funding gaps. Um, I wonder if you could just explain what you mean by a funding gap. OK, well, at a later section in the report, you'll see that we try to set out the nature of the, the gaps that local government is likely to face in our view. Um, I'll say one or two brief remarks and then uh, Fraser or Martin might want to come in behind me. Um, clearly, um, as auditors, um, there's a limit to how much crystal ball gazing uh, we can really undertake. But what we're doing here is making some assumptions, partly based on what we've seen in the past, but also based on, on current trends as to what is likely to happen in local government funding over the next two to three year period. And the reason that we say that there are likely to be funding gaps is, A, because there have been. If you'd taken a similar standpoint two, three, five years ago, you'd have seen the same pattern emerging, but not perhaps quite to the same extent. Um, and I would caution that the expression funding gaps might be interpreted by some as meaning there's some kind of black hole in local government finance. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is that at this point in time, for councils looking to a two, three year horizon, um, they will not in every case have managed to anticipate how they will square off the budget as they have to do under statute, um, reconciling on the one hand the pressures that they have for service delivery and demand for services, and on the other hand, a likely reduction in the funding. So we're using estimates and assumptions, as the report makes clear, to try to get a picture of that. And the main point that we make there is that um, even if nothing else were done, um, there's generally speaking a good cover for the first couple of years anyway in terms of the reserves. But we obviously don't think that use of reserves is a sustainable way of closing off these gaps and reconciling the difference between the expenditure requirements and the funding on the other. Um, but in every case in recent years when that's been the case, local government has then gone back to the drawing board. They've come up with further options for savings, and we fully anticipate that's what will happen in the next few years. It's just that at this point, we can't identify what those savings would be in every case. Thank you. I don't know if um, Fraser or Martin want to add anything to that. No, thank you, Computer. No, okay. Okay. Um, Graham? So, just, just for clarity, um, your definition of a funding gap is, is essentially the, 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 the difference between forecasted income and their likely expenditure. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, it might be useful to add, sorry, that, that it's expenditure reduced for the approved savings in 1617. So what we are saying is that the funding gap is 
the difference between what you'll spend, assuming you make all your savings and your income, and within the model we've shown that as being funded from the general fund reserve. Okay, okay. So when when you say there's not a black hole, that sounds like a black hole to me. <laughs> uh, well, it isn't. Um, so I say what we're saying is that, and we make the point elsewhere in the report, that uh, we strongly think that councils should take a long-term view on their financial planning and we identify where that is happening and where it isn't happening. Um, we recognise that that's more difficult um, when they've had to deal with one-year settlements, as they have done for the last couple of years, and there's no way of knowing at this point in time whether that's a pattern that will repeat itself for the years that lie ahead. Um, but we think they should plan for the long term, and one of the reasons why there is this difference between their expenditure as projected and their income as projected is because we can't, um, in every instance, um, see how councils would square off those gaps on the assumptions that they would have to make. Um, but what we do know is that in every case in the past when that's been, the, that's been an issue, councils have done that, and you can see that from the performance on the outturn. We're saying at the beginning they have managed the finance as well, even though two to three years ago they might have had funding gaps, they will turn to this and find other savings. So it's not a black hole. Okay. Okay, Mr Simpson. Finished? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Can I can I maybe ask a little bit about about the start of this report? I mean, I think the, the the biggest piece of publicity around this report was when it was published. It wasn't as bad as people actually thought it was was going to be. It shows quite shrewd financial planning by local authorities, uh, robust reserves. It clearly shows significant challenges. That 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 that's within the report as well. But the bit that's attracted, if you like, some political attention, has been the ongoing debate of whether local local government has been targeted more so or less so than uh, the public sector more generally in Scotland. And what this report seems to say uh, very early on is that an 8.4% real terms cut over the period that you look at, that it has by and large had a similar revenue cut to the Scottish budget at large. Now, that will then be used by all political parties in this place and interpreted in various ways, but how? what would you say in relation to that? Uh, well, Mr Hines. I'll ask Martin to uh, give a detailed explanation of how we came up with those statistics. All I'd say is we stand by the figures that are in there. It does depend what question you think you're trying to answer. And the question that we think we're trying to answer there is whether, in terms of the flow of funds, from the Westminster government through the Scottish government and eventually down to the local government, in terms of that context, what is the comparison between uh, the reductions that have been faced by the Scottish government on the one hand and by local government on the other? And so we asked that question with an open mind, not quite knowing what the answer would be. The answer is what we say in the report, but explicitly in coming to that conclusion, we've treated certain relevant flows of funds, including non-domestic rates, in a particular way, and I'll ask Martin to explain more about that and why we've done it. And that was very helpful, uh, Mr Hines, because I was going to specifically ask about non-domestic rates. So you've saved me asking the question, but Mr McLaughlin, if you could see how those have been accounted for, that would be very helpful. Certainly. Um, I think the easiest way of thinking of it is that we've looked at the totality of funding for local government against, if you like, the available Scottish government budget, if you make the assumption that non-domestic rates will flow directly to local government. Um, so what we found is that if you take the revenue grant funding, the non-domestic rates, um, capital grant funding, then you get the cut that we put in the report of 8.4%. We've compared that to the revenue Dell and capital Dell elements of the Scottish Government budget, so the spending limits, as it were, where there's an 8.7% reduction. Um, within that, as I said, we're looking at the total against the available so we've excluded NDR from the Scottish Government side of it. What we do say in the report is that if you look at the revenue funding, the Scottish Government provides guaranteed revenue funding, which is non-domestic rates and revenue grants. And what we've said is that in recent years, non-domestic rates are making up an increasing proportion of that total revenue funding. The figures that are available in Exhibit 2 and the paragraphs leading up to it can be used to demonstrate that, if you like, an increase in the non-domestic rates has offset some larger reductions in the revenue grant proportion of that funding. So it really depends 
what you can pay on. Okay, now, just for clarity on non-domestic rates, because we, we, we looked at some of this in relation to we were looking at council tax uh, uh, matters here. Now, now the actual cash flow of non-domestic rates, they're retained by local authorities, but there's a revenue adjustment which takes into account what the government call a needs-based formula. So mm -hmm. they do appear in the income side for councils, but not in the revenue support side from government to local authorities. Um, if you like, the, the revenue support side is calculated as a total revenue support and the grant is a balancing figure between the total and the non-domestic rates. So if, for example, a council actually, for whatever reason, achieved an increase in the non-domestic rates as to what was forecast over and above what was forecast, apologies, um, then there would be a corresponding reduction in the revenue grant support so that the totality of revenue funding is made up of those two balancing figures. Okay. So, so in essence, it is counted? It is counted. I'm not an accountant. I'm just looking no, for... No, no, it is it's counted. A, simplistic clarity, if you like. What, what we have for. not done when we've looked at the reduction in the Scottish Government budget is we have not included non-domestic rates within that calculation. We've looked at the, the departmental expenditure limits on both the capital and revenue side right. that have been set for the Scottish Government. Okay, it might be helpful for my benefit, if not the rest of the committees, if you maybe send the committee a note just outlining that in some more detail at a later date. Can I ask about other numbers? I'm wondering if it's included in that or not. Um, and again, the, one of the, we want to understand better the figures, but mm -hmm. we, if you like, um, local authorities won't appreciate being this pleasantly surprised at those numbers given the, the heat around local authority uh, budgets at the moment. So the £250 million that comes from the Scottish Government into health board budgets, but is transferred pretty much in its entirety uh, to local authority social work services, irrespective of the delivery model around that, is that included? No, we exclude that because it doesn't appear within local government funding settlements and it doesn't appear within the portfolio that that's part of. It appears within the health budget. So we've excluded that because it's not explicitly within the local government funding settlements. Where you will see it is you will see it recognised within council's accounts as a source of income. Okay, I, I understand why. I, I, I think I understand why you've treated it that way, because if it shows up in both the health budget and the local authority budget, it could be deemed to be double counting. I, I, I suppose, but in relation to with this committee, who are still doing their budget scrutiny in relation to uh, local government and cost pressures and everything else, uh, the Scottish Government has asserted in several occasions that the real fall is about, I think, 1%, they say, in budgets, if you include that £250 million. Now, the monies definitely alleviate potential cost pressures within local authority statutory duties, but it doesn't show up in their funding position. Uh, would would you consider doing a small piece of work just so we can either see whether the Scottish Government is accurate when it makes its assertions or, or, or what the real position is? Because it would be helpful to this committee to better understand that. Okay. Sorry, Mr McKinley. If I can come in there, Convener. So you might remember that in our overview report that we presented to you earlier in the year, we had this very discussion because you might remember that there was indeed some disagreement between us and the government about the numbers we came up with. Yeah. So um, so we didn't come up with the 1% number. That's That was their number, and we can see how they've come up with that. Um, but for the reasons that Martin set out, that £250 million did officially go into the health budget. And then beyond that, convener, I think there is, a, there is debate out there about exactly what then happened to that money. And I think you heard some of that in the committee just a few weeks ago when you had uh, what looked like a very interesting discussion with folk from local government. So, so we're we're trying to keep, and, and I take your point about um, simplicity and clarity. We're we're trying to get to that, but it is very complicated, and and it is further complicated. I have to say, when when government say, well, this money's kind of for local government, but we're putting it into the health budget. Um, so so we're not including that for these numbers because because in in, in practical terms. It wasn't, and as, and as you well know, at least half of that money or thereabouts was it was taken up for the, the living wage element as well. So, um, so for those reasons, we've excluded that from our calculations in terms of the local government settlement. Would would you consider um, doing a piece of work a, a, around that? 
because I mean, I, we were all we're, we're here as committee members, but we'll, we'll also sit as party members in, in plenary sessions of the chamber, and we we, we, we latch on to these numbers to sure. make the most convenient use of our, our debate uh, during debates for whatever political party we happen to represent. It would be quite good to have clarity from a committee point of view on what the impact of those numbers have been. Well, the commission has already produced a report on health and social care integration, which is the first of three reports we intend to produce there. The second one, which will be due in the next year to 18 months, will look at, amongst other things, what's happened with the new authorities, the integrated joint boards in the early stages of their development. Part of that will have to be what funding actually flowed to them, from where, and how was it used, and how effectively was it used. So of necessity, we will have to look at, I think, the questions that you're asking. At this stage, um, all we've been able to say about the, uh, the joint boards is that they also are complicated, um, partly because of the governance that surrounds them, so compounding the complications that we've already described around local government finance, we have the complexities of the governance of these bodies, and until that settles down, we won't really know for sure how much money did flow into them and for what purpose it was used. But we will certainly be looking at that as part of the next phase of that work. Okay, um, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe move on a little bit. I just want to, because uh, Spice prepared a really helpful briefing in relation to getting beneath some of these numbers. I want to put a couple of those questions on the record as well before I bring my, my colleagues in. Um, so, uh, can we ask how, the, the, how it accounts, how you account for the transfer of police and fire powers and associate funding in the year 2013 to make figures comparable between different years and whether it's approach here, whether your approach here differs from that of the, of, of the Scottish Government? Um, well, up until the point where they were transferred from local government to central government, um, there were elements within the local government funding settlement that included police and fire grant. So our approach has always been to use draft budget documentation to remove the police and fire budget from that. We slightly altered our methodology this year because as well as the overall grant for those services within the funding settlements prior to 12th, prior to 13-14, apologies, um, there were elements of ring-fenced funding, um, commonly referred to as top slicing for police and fire pension costs, um, to better, if you like, create the, create the distinction between the two funding flows. We've now removed that from our prior year figures. Um, it differs slightly from some of the work I've seen Spice do, where they've taken the opposite approach, and from... 12, 13 onwards, they have added in the police and fire funding back in to compare it on that basis. But bo both are equally valid, in my opinion, but we tend to do it in the approach that we take so that it ties back directly to the settlement figures. So the, the key thing is you exclude the figures irrespective of where it appears in the budget line, so we're looking at comparable figures throughout, throughout the years. Is that yes. Yeah. See, that's simple and clear for me. That, that, I, I like that answer. Uh, f f final point I wanted to, to, to ask was uh, why the figure for the revenue reduction since 2010-11, which is deemed to be 6.8%, is different from that cited in the local government overview <coughs> report published in March 2016, which is down 11%. And, uh, that wasn't my reading of, of those reports. That was uh, information prepared for us for this committee, but it's been pointed out that there's a difference there, and an explanation around that would be quite helpful. Yep. Yeah. I just outlined where we have made a further adjustment for, if you like, the ring fenced funding primarily for police and fire pensions. So that is the net effect of reducing the 1011, what we class classify as local government funding 1011 by approximately 300 million. That follows through to if you're comparing the current year to 1011, then obviously the corresponding percentage reduction is reduced. Um, within the funding settlement, Although they're comparable across years, there's elements of funding that for ring fence national priorities or other priorities or other ring fence reasons which go in there. So although we to we treat it as total low government funding, there are discrepancies to what's included each year. We felt this year in order to better separate the impact of police and fire being reclassified, we would go back and look again at our earlier figures and adjust for the top slicing, as it were. Okay. Can I clarify on that? Yes, of course, Elaine. Uh, thanks very much, convener, and welcome uh, to the committee. Can I just clarify, you mentioned um, 
Mr McLaughlin, the ring fencing. So if the government, ha in, in paragraph 15 of your report, you also talk about um, the, the, the funding to support implementation of national policies. So is that then included in the um, in paragraph 14, the 8.4%? Uh, so anything that the government gives to local government for their national purposes is included in that? Yes, that will be included okay, in the totality of the funding. We have outlined in paragraph 16 of the report and in the footnotes to Exhibit 2 some of the larger elements that perhaps don't appear in each year. Thank you. That, that does, um, I'm just going to leave this sitting. If you could come back with a note, and I know Mr White wants to, want, want to come in now, but it did make me think about what is a national or local priority. We've got the £100 million uh, attainment funds that are going to be raised each and every year. A national priority, locally raised, but education is a statutory duty of local authorities, so it's not always clear what's national or what's local. Uh, we've got city deals coming into the mix as well, for their support from Westminster and Scottish governments in relation to that. Um, some of that could be dealing with projects that local authorities may have commenced with anyway, therefore alleviating other financial pressures elsewhere. And it's just that appeal again that... It's becoming, like, it's becoming overly complicated to actually look at the financial position of local authorities. And governments, by definition, tries to make it look as strong as possible for local authorities. And local authorities, by definition, tries to make it look as bleak. And this committee wants to actually look at the specific figures as best we can. And you guys are best placed to, to, to do that job. So please don't answer. Mr McKinley, please do answer if you want. But... Some information in writing would be helpful also, Mr um, Just very briefly, Convener, just to say we absolutely agree with that. And and what, what we and the, one of the reasons we wanted to do this report was to try to bring some clarity to it. I think what we'll be doing um, now that this report's out and in the early months of next year is gathering people together. I think we need to have a wider conversation about how best to present this stuff because SPICE do it a bit differently, we do it a bit differently well-respected organisations like the Fraser of Allender are, are producing stuff as well, and in every report you find slightly different numbers. I think what we can do with the Accounts Commission is bring all those people together and have a conversation about how can we best present some of this very complex data um, in a way that is consistent and, and might help some, and might help bring a bit of clarity. So that's that's something that we can try and influence over the next few months. OK, that, that's helpful. Mr Whiteman. Uh, thank you, Convener. Thank you for coming. Um, I was about to make the very point that Fraser has responded to um, because all the advice we've had internally in relationship to um, the, uh, uh, rev the, the funding for local government vis-à-vis -vis Scottish government is that it suffered a disproportionate cut. And I, do, I simply don't understand to this date, even notwithstanding your explanation, Martin, how the, you can include non-domestic rates on one side of the equation but not... Not, not, not the other. But we'll, 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 we'll leave that and revisit it. And I think it would be helpful for members and the public to have one set of data and figures that could be understood, because this is different from other sources. But you've, you, you've addressed that. Can I move on to the question of fees and charges? Um, they account now for quite a large proportion of local government's income, £4.8 uh, billion. Pounds. Have you done any investigations into the extent to which those have, have, have grown, where, where the particular growth has been uh, in different services, etc. The short answer is no, we haven't as of yet. Um, one of the reasons that we thought this piece of work was worth doing in the separate way that I, I, I described earlier is because it allows an opportunity to kind of peel the layers of the onion a little bit and fees and charges are, as you say, a significant component. The, the hypothesis, I, I suppose, might be that in the light of other funding pressures uh, that councils have increased fees and charges um, in order to avoid cutting services, but that's all it is at this stage. We don't have the evidence to show that one way or the other. And because we don't, um, we're minded to do a dedicated piece of work um, as part of our performance audit programme, or indeed looking in more detail at this particular, at, at an overview level, uh, as early as next March when we produce the overall report on, lo on local government um, because we think it is an interesting issue. Um, if I can just take a slight aside, we know that south of the border where the funding pressures, if anything, on councils are, are more uh, extreme, um, that there has been a significant increase in fees and charges there um, as a way of avoiding uh, some of the worst cuts that they might be faced with. Now, there's no way of 
saying at this stage whether that's happening to any extent north of the border, but we think it's an interesting area to look at. Um, and we do know that our sister organisation in Wales has had a detailed look at how fees and charges in local government there have been treated, and there are very many interesting questions, not just the level of increase if there's been one, but actually the policies, the strategies and so on that inform the fees and charges. So we think that's an area worthy of investigation. Um, but at this stage, all we can tell you is what's we, what we say in the report here, namely that they are a, a growing component, a significant component, but we don't have a breakdown. The other key thing that we say in the report is that the current way of accounting for fees and charges is less than wholly satisfactory. From our point of view, it's difficult to pull fees and charges of themselves out of the local authority accounts because other elements of funding are in there, which we probably would not regard as fees and charges, but they're accounted for in that fashion. So we would like to see some changes to that going forward because that would help um, with our work and I think it would help the public to understand what's happening with fees and charges in their area. Okay, thank you. That's useful. I think the worry for me is that, um, and many of us, is that fees and charges are a flat tax in a sense and they, they're, 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 they're regressive. Um, moving on, I just want one final uh, question, convener. Uh, I think I raised in an earlier session what your thoughts would be in relationship to the establishment of a fiscal framework for local government funding similar to that which exists between the UK government and, um, and, 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 and Holyrood to provide some certainty. I mean, you've identified a funding gap, and one of the problems with local government planning its finances is it's never entirely sure what the consequences will be of actions that it takes at its hand vis-a-vis -vis, um, national policies that government may want to implement at another, and that leads, in, in my view, certainly to a degree of uncertainty going forward. Um, have you had any further thoughts on that question? Um, so, I think, like we said last time, Mr. Whiteman, clearly it's for Scottish government and local government to decide whether it's a, 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 a version of a fiscal framework. I think what we would say is that anything that helps clarity and the ability to long-term plan is a good thing. Um, so whether that's a framework or, or a set of assumptions that could be set out or what that is, um, I, I think it should be up for debate. But certainly anything that helps um, in this instant councils, although I have to say we see the same thing about health boards and other parts of our work too, anything that helps <coughs> that longer term and more strategic financial planning has to be a good thing because um, while we absolutely recognise the challenge of doing it in a world where we're having annual settlements, if anything, we think it makes it even more important that councils are, are able to plan for the medium and long term. So I think that's where we, that's where we get to. Thank you. Kate, okay, leads there. Thanks very much, Convener. Can we go back to fees and charges for a moment, please? Um, the overall report seems to indicate, and I think you said at the, the beginning, Mr Hines, that the state of financial health of councils is perhaps not as dire as might have been um, thought previously. However, I wonder if, you, if you're going to be looking into fees and charges, is, is that um, perhaps due to councils managing cuts? So looking at things like the loss of staff, and if you lose staff, obviously you have big costs at the beginning, you may save further down the line, but if you're losing staff, then you're losing people are losing their services because a big part of what local government does is provide its services through the people that it employs. So would that be part of this? Is it something that you would be looking at? As part of a review into fees and charges? As um, part of it, yes, and taking that across the whole state of council finances, if you like, because I presume it has to fit in with that. If you're reviewing fees and charges, you would be fitting in as part of that whole picture. Um, well, we haven't yet sat down and specified the piece of work that I described earlier, um, so I couldn't say for sure whether we would include um, workforce issues as part of it or not. What I would say is that they're both quite significant and largely distinct elements of what councils have to do, um, just to set their budget every year, but also to address the kind of reductions that they've had to make in recent years. The lion's share of the reductions that we see councils making um, do impact directly on the workforce. We've commented on that in previous reports. We touch on it again here. And our line on that, if you like, is that we understand fully why that has to happen. Over 60% of the costs of local government are the costs of paying their staff. So there's no way of making these savings without, um, if you like, going to staff reductions. But what we would like to see accompany that is a more consistent approach to what we call workforce planning. And the concern might be 
um, that if, if there isn't that consistent approach to workforce planning, which is a kind of parallel to what Fraser was saying about financial planning, taking a long-term view, that you find yourself in a situation where the way that you now have to deliver services because of the transformation programmes and the changes that you've had to make to address the funding, the way that you have to work might not fit your workforce. You might end up with square pegs and round holes, if you like. So taking a long-term view, planning for scenarios and adjusting your workforce down the way, because that's the way funding is going, is all very well, but you want to make sure that you're left with a workforce that's fit for purpose. Now, to the extent that that touches on fees and charges, I would agree with you, um, but I think they're quite a separate sphere of the budget process, and we probably want to focus on those because they raise interesting questions in their own right. Well, if I could go back to the fees and charges briefly then, convener, and some of the questions that they might raise, would you envisage looking at then the, the change in nature of local government around that, if you like, so that we've moved away perhaps from the universal approach of local government, whereby you, you, you take your, your grant from government, you would draw in funding as you desire through your, your tax elements, and then you would be able to provide services universally. But now, if we look at fees and charges, what, what, what we perhaps find is, and take an example of community alarms, that certain elements of the, the population are now paying rather than it being a universal approach or perhaps burial charges, anything of that nature? Is that something that you would be considering as part of that report? Absolutely. Um, I think if we do it, we will want to look across the board at fees and charges because it covers a multitude of areas and they're all very different. You've already given a couple of examples of that. So we would be interested in a range of questions and I won't detain you with uh, covering all of those, but one would be the policy or policies plural that the councils are employing there because you could take one approach which says needs must we have to avoid the worst of the savings that are in front of us and um, so we will just increase fees across the board by the rate of inflation or some other figure which is a valid approach but i think we would then ask questions about whether that sufficiently respects the differences between charges for one thing and fees for another you could take a different approach which would be far more forensic and look at the different fees and charges in their own right and come up with individual policies around those. Or you could have different points on that spectrum. So those are the kind of questions we'd be interested in. And as I say, at this point, it's a bit of a gleam in our eye. But this report points out, I think, well enough why we would want to look at that, because it's such a significant part of funding overall. And as other elements reduce, of necessity, fees and charges go up as a proportion. I think that's something the committee would be interested in. Um Coming back to well, certainly something we can consider. Um, Kenneth Gibson. Yeah, I would certainly endorse that. Certainly, be something uh, I'd be interested. <coughs> I'm sure we all would be. I mean, I think what's uh, really. Uh, um, you know, hits you uh, between the eyes is the fact that uh, the service income fees and charges at 4.8 billion is significantly higher than housing and uh, council tax income combined of 3.3 billion for local authorities, more than a quarter of the total. And what we, he we hear often that uh, local government, you know, apparently only raises about 20% or less of its income, but this graph seems to suggest it's more, it's slightly more than 40% uh, when one includes. Uh, fees and charges. But the, the, the question, uh, to move on from that, was just about something else that you said, Mr Hines. You talked about the, um, uh, um, in response to Elaine about uncertainty going forward. And, uh, and, in, and in terms of paragraph 72 to 74, you emphasise the importance of good financial planning and management are required to ensure the impact of spending decisions is fully understood. And you say it's imperative that they, that they have these long-term financial strategies and the absence of indicative funding should not prevent councils projecting future income and spending. But you go on to point out that three councils, East Renfrewshire, Glasgow City Council and Highland, do not have a financial strategy covering the medium or long term. What's the potential impact of not having that financial strategy in place? Um, well, if you haven't looked far enough into the future to see what situation you might be faced with against the expectation or the assumption um, that you have to make about your funding and the demand for your services, then the risk, I think, is that when you come to the annual budget setting exercise, which is a highly pressured um, event, as, as MSPs will no doubt appreciate, that you might not make the optimal decisions, mm -hmm. or you might make decisions which a year later you would regret or seek to amend because of events that have transpired. 
Now, we, we can't say that we've got evidence on an individual council basis of that kind of thing happening. It just seems to us to be a primary, prima facie eye risk. And we also think, and that's what's um, said in that section of the report, that the longer term financial plans or strategies ideally should be aligned with a bigger plan or strategy for the council. Now, councils have those plans and strategies. They have them for the council itself. They have them as part of their membership of community planning. So if you like, that bigger picture of the vision and the strategies is there. But what we find is that they're not always aligned or joined with the financial plans. Sometimes they're out of sync um, because they've been produced at different times and they expire at different times. Sometimes the connections that could be made there aren't made there because they're treated as separate <coughs> exercises. And that also seems to us to compound the risk that the savings that you have to make on an annual exercise through the budget um, will be the wrong ones, or not the best ones, because you haven't looked at them in the context of a financial plan that clearly marries up with your overall strategy. So those are the kinds of risks. And I wouldn't single out those three councils and say that they are more at risk in that regard, but we do think um, that it's fair to point out that some councils are able to look beyond the one-year horizon, and there's no reason, therefore, why all can't do it. It seemed to me, given what you're saying, that these three local authorities would be at greater risk. I mean, surely if there's no financial planning, as you've indicated, then that could indeed mean greater pain than would otherwise be the case. It could mean, you know, you find yourself with a, a mismatch between the staff required and the resources available uh, to pay them and indeed the service demands that are put on them. So surely we have to do more to encourage all local authorities to take forward medium and long-term financial planning. I read, and that's very much the message that we've been communicating in this report and some of its predecessors as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, can I maybe just mop up a couple of things that I wanted to ask about before we cl close this session? Uh, within the report, there you talk about um, planned spending and underspends or overspends across various services within local authorities. <coughs> One of the, the the reason I'm interested in that is we, we, I asked a similar question during budget scrutiny, um, and it was in relation to a reported, un a significant £160 million reported underspend in relation to a uh, nursery provision uh, for monies provided to local authorities that the government said hadn't been spent on that purpose. Now, I think it's fair to say what one or two local authority representatives got a little bit prickly when I was asking about that, but the real reason for asking about it wasn't to say, why haven't you spent that money? It was more the dynamic about, you know, if you're given monies for one particular function at a local authority level, if you can do that efficiently, underspend on it, and transfer that from one service to another, that is a good use of resources. I wouldn't be quibbling with that at all, I have to say. So in turn, how should we read mm. statistics on underspends or overspends within this report, or is there a piece of work having to be done to actually follow the public pound through from, if you like, ring fence or otherwise uh, revenue support from Scottish Government? Look at the outturn report at a local level, and it seems to me to be, if you don't hit it on the nose, you might be worried that you'll get less money next time, so therefore you hit it on the nose, and that doesn't really encourage efficiencies necessarily in delivering the system. So any comments to make on underspends at a departmental level from local authorities? Uh, yeah, thanks, convener. I think there's two slightly different things at play there. One is, and, and, and this would require a specific piece of work, I think, where um, money that some of the, the the amounts of money we've referred to earlier that is given from Scottish Government to local government for specific purposes and the extent to which that is then spent on that specific purpose and the extent to which that over or underspent is one thing. I think what this report focuses mainly on is, if you like, the, the, more, the more general overspend and underspend uh, position and, and if it would be helpful to the committee we can we can write to you with a bit more detail about some of the individual service areas that are obviously made make up uh, the likes of um, Exhibit 5, where we talk about the overall underspends and overspends. It's a very complex picture, and there are some patterns, but there are also there is also enormous variation across the country, depending on which council you're in. I suppose my, our, our general observation um, is that um, the nature of the underspend or overspend is as, is as important as the size of it. And for us, the thing that we are most interested in is the extent to which it's planned or unplanned. So if at the end of the year you suddenly discover that you've underspent your budget by 10%, we don't think that's a terribly good thing, um, if that wasn't the plan, because presumably that was money that had been earmarked to be spent on something. Equally, at the last minute, if you discover you're going to be overspent, that's not great either. If you're planning to do those things as part of a longer-term 
strategy, then that's quite a different set of circumstances. So, so you, you kind of need to get into a more qualitative assessment of the nature of those. I think what we're trying to do here was just give a sense of where councils are overall uh, in terms of living within their means. Mm. I think I think that's very helpful. I'm sure uh, Mr. Mr. Gibson will also concur from his time chairing the Finance Committee uh, as, as legislation goes through the Parliament. That 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 that, that tussle or negotiation between. It causes and Scottish government over what should or should be a financial memorandum, what those numbers should look like. So, we're at the Finance Committee, the Local Government Communities Committees. I'm quite interested to know actually what happens then in practice, year two, year three, and any work around that. I think sure. would be would would be quite helpful. Another thing I wanted to kind of mop up was actually inspired by Deputy Convener's question in relation to staffing. Uh, I met with uh, striking workers uh, from Glasgow City Council's ICT team uh, in relation to a dispute over outsourcing and moving from employment from Glasgow City Council to uh, a, a private company. I make no comment on the dispute, but the point they were making is they would no longer be employed by Glasgow City Council if the plans go ahead. Would that then show up on figures in relation to staffing cuts? Because they would still be employed. They would say potentially with weaker terms and conditions and there on there and hangs the dispute. But across local authorities, there could be examples of this where headcount isn't going down but it is going down within directly employed public sector itself, and Alios would sit within that as well. So any comments on that? Um, yes, I mean, your reference to Alios is, is, is opposite. One of the issues that we have to contend with when we're trying to do analysis of workforce trends is what might at first appear to be a reduction in the workforce um, turns out to be just what you're describing. It's a transfer rather than a reduction, and ostensibly even the same number of staff could be employed but by a different employer and therefore no longer featuring in the employment records of a given council. So we always have to have an eye open for that and make some kind of adjustment. And it goes back uh, nicely to the opening discussion because it really depends what question it is you're trying to answer. If the simple question is how many people does the council employ, then there's a ready-made answer to that. If the question is how many people are providing public services, it's a different answer. So you really need to be clear what it is you're trying to demonstrate. OK, that, that's very helpful. And the clerk team's helpfully passed me a note to say that I should remind everyone that uh, we'll be hearing on the 21st of December from the Cabinet Secretary and the Minister in relation to, to budget scrutiny and anything that you wanted to provide. Based, we've asked for some additional information here today. If we did get it before then, it would be would be helpful. Uh, sure. no, no pressure there in relation to that. But uh, the, 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 the evidence session is pretty much concluded. I would like to maybe afford you the opportunity to add anything else to the record before we, we briefly suspend, before we move to the next agenda item? Perhaps if I may, just, just one point that hasn't come up in the discussion, but um, we think might be uh, quite significant in the context of the report. The easiest way to look at it is in Exhibit 4, um, where we try to demonstrate on a, a net expenditure basis, i.e. we've knocked off the fees and charges that we talked about earlier. But we try and show a trend there of the impact of the reduction in funding uh, or spending rather, in this case it's expenditure, over the five-year period. And the, the simple point that I would make is that, um, as we said earlier, there's a debate about how much of the, of the funding available to Scottish Government is then being dedicated to local government. When you get past that stage into local government, there's a debate about how best to spend that sum of money, whatever it is, including things like your council tax. And clearly priorities come into that, just as they do at the national level. So what this is really showing is that, in a very rough and ready sense, there's priority being given to the, the preservation of some level of expenditure for both education and social care. You can see that in the diagram. But because overall funding is on a downward trend, the impact of that on other services is commensurately significant. And because they represent a smaller proportion of the spending in the first place, any cut imposed upon them is a bigger issue for them. Now, I wouldn't say more than that at this stage, other than that if that's a five-year pattern that we're seeing, and if you try to anticipate that the next five years might look something like that, it emphasises the point that we keep making about the importance of scenario and long-term planning. I think it would be better to get into that with one's eyes open to see how things might look for transportation or environmental services or leisure and cultural services at the end of that five-year period rather than to go through it and look back and say, hmm, this is an interesting place that we find ourselves. Okay, that, that is it. 
Well, I, I, I think, yes, I, I think let's uh, apologies to our witnesses for the next evidence session who will be waiting, but I think it's important, you raise an important point, uh, 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 you want to draw it to, to, to the committee's attention, I think it's reasonable to ask a, a, a brief, hopefully, follow-up question in relation to that, yeah? Well, it was, but it was also about something that hadn't been mentioned either, which affects that, I would imagine, and that, that was the, the, the debt. Um, we haven't really discussed that in any depth at all, and you did. You've mentioned um, the you've mentioned PFI and NPD in the same sentences. So I just wonder how how they actually do fit together. But one thing I specifically wondered about was, and I have to declare an interest as a member of Unite the Union, that they have been talking about the historic debt and how that affects local government finance. And I wondered if you just had any sort of opinion about that at all. Uh, so the question is really about the the, the debt. And, well, and how that squeezes, the, yeah. once we get to local government, to your, your Exhibit 4, yeah. how that then squeezes the okay. services. I'll take the second part, if you like, and I'll ask Fraser to handle the wider question about the, uh, the impact of indebtedness. So you're absolutely right. Um, if you're having to look at budget reductions, then your room for manoeuvre is a key consideration. And on the face of it, there's less room for manoeuvre. It's not to say there's none, but there's less for things that look like fixed costs, such as repayment of debt and the interest charges that go with them. So we do have an exhibit in the report that shows the kind of impact of that. And that would be a further squeeze, if you like, on those services that I've described earlier as being afforded relatively less protection, if I can put it in those terms. So you're absolutely right about that. But the wider question about um, the indebtedness itself and the affordability of the repayments... I'll, ha I'll ask Fraser to have a go at that. Yeah, nothing much to add, um, Ronnie, I don't think, other than to say the Commission have asked us to have a look at those issues specifically as part okay. of the, the forward work programme, probably getting into uh, 2018 by the time we, we're, we're looking to publish that report. But we recognise that um, the kind of historical debt that PFI, PPP and its predecessors um, have established is, a, is an increasingly important part of this story for exactly the reasons that that you and Ronnie have just described. So we are going to be taking a look at that specifically. Thank you. OK. I think it's helpful. And I think, Deputy Convener, I think part of the debt that is a struggle for local authorities might even be pre-devolution pre uh, public debts that, sure. that from, from the, the Treasury, actually, which might be at significant rates of interest compared to the current interest rates. I think that might reflect some of the Unite campaign, um, which you may or may not... Um, be aware of. It might be quite good to, to have a look at it. I didn't have to declare an interest, but I have met with them. In the, 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 so I wanted to um, re reinforce the point uh, our Deputy Convener was making. Thank you very much for, for your time this morning. We found that very, very helpful and look forward to continuing this relationship going forward. And we suspend briefly before we move to the next agenda item. Thank you.
Okay, uh, good morning everyone, and as you've been following it, welcome back. I'm sure someone out there is following this uh, on, online, I'm sure. Um, we move to agenda item two, which is implications for Scottish local government of the United Kingdom leaving the European Union. And the committee is holding an evidence session on the implications for Scottish local government of the United Kingdom leaving the European Union. Today's session... Um, it says here it will take place in a roundtable format. No, it won't. Uh, so we won't do that. But we've got a, a number of witnesses attending. First of all, can I put in the apology of David Iser, Research Associate, Fraser Valley Institute, University of Strathclyde, who was hoping to come along today, but is unable to make it. But I can welcome Councillor David O'Neill, President of COSLA. Uh, good morning. Jim Savage, Savage Solis, Scotland, and Chief Executive Aberdeenshire Council. Helen Martin, Assistant Secretary, Scottish Trade Union Congress. Professor James Mitchell, Co-Director, Academy of Government, University of Edinburgh. And Stuart Black, Highlands and Islands European Partnership and Director of Development Infrastructure, Highland Council. Thank you everyone for coming along this morning for what will be a, a, a short inquiry in, into what the implications may be uh, in relation to Brexit for Scottish uh, and U indeed UK local government. Can I maybe... Um, open up just by looking at one of the most uh, striking aspects uh, of of funding uh, towards local government is, as you'd expect, politicians are always quite often drawn to the public pound and they, they want to see what the financial position is. And, and, and I see that in relation to European structural funds that I do understand have been guaranteed by the UK government that anything committed up until 2020 will be will be met by them. That's my understanding. Someone might want to clarify that, but that's your understanding. But the uh, local authorities are roughly delivering about 30% of, of those funds. And that for the time period 2014 uh, through to 2020, that would be roughly 30%, depending on what is or isn't committed, of about £900 million. So a, a huge chunk of cash trickling through uh, local authorities. Uh, my own local authority, Glasgow City Council, is the, the most significant delivery agent of that. So as a constituency MSP, I would have concerns for what could happen post-2020. Um, but anything around what witnesses consider to be the reassurances and the process pre-2020 would be would be very welcome, given the fact there's about £450 million pounds still to be to be allocated in that process. That might be a good starting point, uh, just kind of following the monies and any reassurances or uh, concerns there are for either pre-2020 or what happens after 2020. Uh, Councillor O'Neill? Uh, it's a very good question, especially following the session that, that you've just, uh, just had in terms of long-term planning, financial planning for local authorities. The only place where we currently have certainty for funding is European money. Uh, the settlements that we are currently getting for the Scottish Government are uh, on a year-to-year -year basis. You cannot uh, really do uh, serious long-term financial planning. What we have been uh, assured of so far is that the programmes up until 2020 uh, will be funded. And if my understanding is right, it's... Uh, it's called plus two. So you have two years after the end of that programme to continue uh, the spend. That's reassuring. What's not reassuring about that is we should be starting the planning for after that right now. We should be in that process and there is absolutely no certainty uh, for that and that, that is a problem for us. Okay, that's helpful. Any other witnesses want to pick up on that, that theme in relation to structural funds? Mr Savage. Reinforce that point, convener. I think that uh, many organisations are already uh, well involved with the uh, schemes and funding arrangements that are already available, and inevitably, as uh, Councillor O'Neill has said, we'll be looking forward to the next term and the next programme in terms of a medium-term plan for their businesses and their organisations, their communities. And so that level of uncertainty, even looking forward to two to three, four years' time now, is impacting people's confidence and assurance in terms of being able to plan and look ahead. And I think that may impact some of the existing commitments in terms of programmes and delivery as well. So there's a double whammy potentially as well. Okay. Anyone want to add to that, Mr Black? Yes, thank you. Um, I think the other point that came up in the previous session was around uh, the decrease in spending which isn't protected by um, Scottish Government. So match funding becomes a real challenge. For example, if you look at employability programmes, which are a major feature of some of the EU schemes at the moment, then the Council has to provide 
50% or thereby match funding for those programmes, and that figure can vary. And as local government spending is reducing in those areas at a higher rate, match funding becomes a challenge. So I think there, that's another issue that's worth considering. Mm. OK, um, I'm going to follow up on that, but uh, Professor Mitchell or Helen Martin, do you want to add anything to that? Um, in terms of the, the, the long-term planning council that you were talking about, had the Brexit vote went, went the other way, had it been a vote to remain, would local authorities, in all, all honesty, be planning now for spends in 2021, 2022, and doing the work around that? In fact, is there work ongoing on the assumption that there should be no detriment and are local authorities gearing up what potential applications would have looked like? Is that work still ongoing? Uh, short answer is yes. Uh, the ERDF, by and large, is for infrastructure projects. There's long-term planning involved in that. Uh, the European Social Fund is for employability, things of, of that nature. And again, those tend to be fairly long term. So, yes, there is forward planning for that. Yeah. Yeah, Professor Mitchell? Yeah, well, I think um, one of the to, to, to note is, of course, the European Union is always forward planning. And so it would be planning now, it started to plan now for the post 2020. And local authorities here, uh, over decades now, membership have been very much involved in those discussions from the outset, which is the key to, to understanding the EU and to be successful in the EU. So there is that process. The point now is, of course, that the local authority of Scotland will not be involved, obviously, in, in the next round. And so the, the way in which I think local authorities will have to engage is not with EU, but with UK government, Scottish government. So it's a different ballgame. And in that respect, well, I mean, we really don't know where we are. Um, and I don't think local authorities can be criticised for that until we have a clearer idea from UK government as to what's happening, what Brexit actually means. It's very difficult to engage. Mm. That's very helpful. Stuart Black? Yes, thank you. Um, I also sit on the Joint Programme Monitoring Committee for the Euro European Structural Funds, which looks at the funds across Scotland. And um, it's interesting that there's a mid-term review about to come, or a, a, a review of the programme's implementation. Obviously, it was meant to be 2014 to 20, and we're some way into that. But there's a mid-term review process and I actually raised at the committee what is being done to look at the post-2020 scenario because it is a really important matter for uh, communities who are used to receiving funding, such as LEADER, for example, uh, Community Economic Development Funding, to have some idea of what might come uh, after the, the Brexit um, situation. Okay. And in normal circumstances, local authorities, Council O'Neill, would be uh, having direct discussions at a European level now as to what those structural funds would look like going forward post-2020? We're not in normal circumstances, but normally would that have been happening? And have you already been excluded from that process? Uh, normally, it would be starting just, no, just now. Uh, have we been excluded from the, the process? Uh, I'll tell you next week when the process does actually right. actually start. Okay. But, but what, what we're clear about is that we need to be engaged in uh, long-term discussions with both the UK and the Scottish Government. Mm. Yeah, and that was going to, I was going to ask a little bit more about that in a second, yeah. but I'm just trying, I suppose what I'm trying to get my head around would be if local government was still involved in those discussions, because Article 50 has not, not, not been, 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 been used yet, it's we, not been commenced, I mean, I'm starting to tease out what that spending might look like post-2020 would then almost create an expectation for what you would be expecting from a, a UK or a Scottish <coughs> government going forward once we're no longer in the European Union. So would you be keen to still be involved in those discussions at a European level, I suppose, is what I'm asking? I, I would suspect yes. Part of the reason I suspect that is if you look at the media, where we had Phil Hammond, the, the Chancellor, saying recently, this might take longer than two years, there might be a transition. I don't think anybody really knows what's going to happen. So we will hedge our bets. Uh, 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 yes, uh, Mr Savage. I think it's uh, back to a point from the previous session as well, which is about scenarios. And uh, what we have is, uh, uh, if we look at city region deals, as an illustration of this one, is economic strategies in different parts of the country, which are covering 5, 10, 15 year periods. And so local authorities are looking forward to that extent. What we have is an ambiguity now in terms of what the funding opportunity is going to be, and therefore potentially a hesitance in terms of actually quite which conversations to have with who in order to be able to deliver those strategies. 
strategies. So the long-term intention is there, but quite where to put one's effort into the conversations and discussions of things, the point in question here. And it could be folly to invest all of your time and effort into one route with that uncertainty, as you said, a convener in terms of quite when and how an exit may happen as well. So it is those different scenarios we are now working through to try to actually work out what's the best route forward to secure long-term funding. Okay, Professor Mitchell. I think one has to consider this uh, not only from the point of view of the UK and local authorities here, but also from our current EU partners. I mean, the fact of the matter is the expectation is the, that Article 50 will be invoked early next year, that the UK will leave. Um, that does not create conditions for local authorities here to have much impact on those negotiations. We have to be very clear and honest about that. Um, we are marginalised, uh, as it were, and there may well be the opportunity to take part initially, um, but I don't think we'll have a, a voice that's going to be listened to very intently. And that's not a criticism of local authorities at all, um, but they are in a weak position. Uh, consider it from the point of view of any other member state. Why would you want to listen to UK local authorities post-2020? And I suppose spending so much uh, time, energy and effort in, in an area that, that ultimately local authorities know is not going to hold the levers of, of spending, spend power and influence. So it's then where you direct your efforts. And it brings us back to the UK and the Scottish governments. Has, has COSLA, uh, what kind of formal efforts have COSLA made to contact and enter into a process with both the Scottish and UK governments? I think it would be fair to say that the level of engagement that uh, COSLA is having, uh, along with our other local government associations in the UK, with the UK government has been excellent. The level of engagement that we've had with the Scottish government has been a meeting. OK. Do you want to maybe expand on that, Any? Because yeah. I, I, I suppose the Scottish government would say... I don't think the Scottish would describe its level of communication with the UK government as excellent. So I'm quite surprised to see a, a difference there in the level of engagement you've had. Maybe expand on that a little bit. Uh, through the Secretary of State for Scotland, uh, I mean, we are getting uh, access to, to civil servants. We're getting uh, meetings arranged with uh, the Brexit Secretary. Uh, as I say, the four local government associations are working together. Uh, the English Local Government Association in particular uh, doing a, a substantial body of work which, which they are sharing uh, with, with the other four, uh, include, including ourselves. So, so we are getting a good level of engagement uh, with the UK government. OK, and in terms of the one meeting that you've had with the Scottish government, are you able to give any details in relation to that? Uh, we met with uh, Mike Russell and Alistair Allen. Uh, that was meant to be a, an initial meeting. We offered uh, to supply information to do what we could to, to assist the, the, the Scottish Government. Uh, COSLA actually shared the view of the Scottish Government during the referendum. Uh, it was a unanimous uh, view of COSLA uh, that we should remain. However, the vote went the other way, so we offered to uh, share the knowledge and expertise that existed within local government. There is a considerable degree of knowledge uh, does exist, uh, and I, I would say more so than actually exists within the Scottish Government. Uh, and other than that one meeting that took place, I don't think there's been any engagement at all. And, and I, I apologise, we seem to be having a kind of one-on-one -on -one dialogue. Yeah. I just want to mop this up and I'll, I'll allow you guys in in, 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 in a second. I think there's maybe a, a, a purpose and a role this, this committee could have. Um, I suspect what you're saying is you want to be of assistance to the Scottish Government yes. taking a, a coordinated approach in relation to... Uh, Brexit, whether it's direct Brexit negotiations, certainly as they affect local government, you want to be working in a coordinated fashion with the Scottish Government in relation to that? Yes, we want to be working with both the Scottish and uh, the, the UK Government. When uh, powers get repatriated to, to the UK, where these powers end up is going to be important. Uh, subsidiarity is important, mm -hmm. and getting the powers to the most appropriate place is very important. <coughs> if it ends up in an inappropriate place, they won't necessarily function as well as they should for communities. OK, that, that's helpful. I'm going to Elaine Smith in for a supplementary first, and then I will take you in, Graham Simpson, OK? Thanks, Convener. Well, actually, um, I suppose it just 
goes a wee bit further on what the convener's been exploring with COSLA. In, in section 15 of the COSLA report, you have specifically said that the appropriate mechanisms should be put in place at political and officer level so that local government is embedded in the Scottish government and UK government negotiation structures. And you go on to say that the same approach has already been confirmed by the UK government um, for reserved areas for Scottish local government. So is, what exactly are you asking of the Scottish government? Is it exactly the same as what has happened with the reserved areas? Is that what you want to see? We do want to be embedded in the process. We don't want to be merely a consultee. We don't want to be uh, lumped in with others. We not only deliver uh, a, a lot of these programmes, we are part of the formal governance of Scotland. We should be embedded in the process. But can we clarify, you're embedded in it with the, the res, as far as the reserved issues with, um, from what you're seeing here in paragraph 15, that you are embedded, but that's not what's happened in, in Scotland? That's not what's happened in Scotland so okay. far. So far. OK. Thank you very much. Could I ask Professor Mitchell something on what he said, or do you uh, want to move on? Well, I just want to check, because I've, I've, I've had bids for someone from Graham Simpson and Kenny Gibson, and if it's on this specific point, I think we should stick to this mm -hmm. and, and then move on. Graham, is it on this, yeah, at this point? Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. very much so. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in what you're saying there, uh, Councillor O'Neill. What have you discussed with the UK government in these various conversations you've had with them? Well, we've talked uh, about the repatriation of powers. We've talked about the continuation of uh, European funding. Uh, we're, we're looking at how uh, how we we influence changes that are going to take place. I'm an, an example in things that would be getting repatriated, uh, and this is only two examples. State aid, the role that local government is going to play in that uh, procurement future procurement, the role that local government and localism is going to be able to, to play uh, play in that. Uh, we want to be in there at the, the start of this to shape how those processes actually deliver for our communities uh, and we need to be embedded in the process to do that, not just merely a consultee. Right. You've actually mentioned all the areas that I would be hoping to uh, ask you all about. That's um, good. That's good. Um, so, uh, just just to be clear, um, have you asked the Scottish Government for meetings and been refused meetings? No. No. No, we have not been refused meetings. Okay. So the meeting that you had, the, the idea, came, the, the approach came from them? No, the approach came from us. We offered uh, to meet with and, and assist as we could but there's been nothing since that. Why, why has there been nothing since? Don't know. But you haven't asked for a meeting? We left it that we were available. Uh, we were offering the knowledge that, that, that we have, uh, and there's, there's not really been any substantive contact uh, since then. I'm sure that the Scottish Government would tell you that they are finding their, their feet, uh, but we are offering to help to find, find their feet. Can I just clarify something? Um, uh, would you like a second meeting quick, fit, uh, as soon as possible to discuss this further? I'd be more than happy to, to meet. <laughs> okay, so we're really debating ASAP. about who picks up the phone to the other to the other person. So let's uh, and, and we, we'll ask about that as well. I'm, from what I'm saying, it's a case that there's been an initial meeting. I suspect both parties thought there'd be more. They haven't progressed, so we should just make it happen. By yeah. that, I mean not this committee, but Cosla should just seek to have a meeting as soon as possible, and if there's any issues with that, this committee would be very interested in relation to that. I just double-check, we keep talking about repatriation, Councillor O'Neill, and, and, and subsidiarity. I, I suppose subsidiarity from what would be my kind of thought, because it's about whether the UK government passes down powers direct to local authorities, then there's powers reserved at a UK level, which they're, via subsidiarity, giving to a local, at a lo local authority level, or whether they pass to the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government and they are passed down. I'm just wondering if the type of conversation you're having with the UK Government is slightly odd because if we're talking about where power sits within the UK, that's a tripartite discussion between UK Government, Scottish Government and Scottish local authorities. So it seems odd to me that where power over fisheries or agriculture or whatever would sit, the discussions that COSLA are having with the UK government, they would sit in terms of sovereignty with a UK government 
who would pass them down to local government. Is is that the ambition of COSLA, or would you rather see them passed down to local government <coughs> and the sovereignty sit at a Scottish level? Uh, I, I'm just trying to wonder what the mission is, what the outcome you're seeking is, Councillor Ail, in relation to that. I, I think the term that I used earlier was uh, that it should rest at the most appropriate place. Some of that, no doubt, would be at the UK level. Some would... I dislike the word level, the UK sphere, the Scottish sphere, the local government sphere. These things are not mutually exclusive. I would suspect that in the fullness of time, uh, all three spheres will, will see some of these powers being uh, devolved or repatriated in, into their, their sphere. Uh, and what's important thereafter is that they don't operate in isolation. We all have to operate in partnership and do it in such a way that we get maximum benefit for our communities. But in all the powers to one single place, I don't think would, would be sensible. Uh, there are some that, that would be a, appropriate, UK, some Scotland, some local government. Uh, we do have the advantage of the four local government associations working together, working jointly. Uh, that gives us uh, an end to the, the UK government that the, we otherwise would not have, have had. Uh, and that, that's a very useful conduit for us. OK, that, that's interesting. Professor Mitchell, do you want to add anything? Uh, really, to, I, was, I think the point I was going to make has just been made at the end there. And I was just to reiterate that I, 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 I do with due respect, I think that the concept of sovereignty is not terribly helpful in this context in as much as it implies an ultimate resting place of power. What we have in terms of public policy um, are different spheres engaged in the same uh, policy areas to take the environment, EU, UK government, Scottish government, local authorities, and many other bodies. Mm -hmm. And it's a sharing, it's a partnership. And I think that's one of the interesting things about the nature of policy in much of the area, much of the work that's done by the EU, not least because the EU itself is incapable, frankly, of delivering. Local authorities are the delivery agencies and have to be involved. And so I think if we, we can try to conceive of the future as one around partnership, sharing, working together, rather than, and I'm, I'm very much uh, in agreement with, with Cosla on this, it's not about levels, it's a kind of much more complex, if you like, that's what I tried to say in the paper, if you like, the, the metaphor of the marble cake rather than the, the layer cake um, really reflects the reality of policy making and policy implementation uh, <coughs> with respect to so much that the EU has been involved in. We now have a situation where the EU will no longer be involved, but there will still have to be partnership sharing engagement and that includes setting agendas putting ideas in for policy making right the way through to to delivery though delivery is almost inevitably and inevitably um, a local authority almost it's one of the few areas where there is a kind of a monopoly if you like in terms of a, a sphere having having control okay that's very helpful helen martin um, yeah, I think this conversation is very interesting and it goes to one of our key concerns really in this process, which is around transparency and around how you hear the voices of communities and workers and other sort of civil society actors in general in the negotiations. Um, we've had a slightly different experience from COSLA. We've had very um, supportive and open access with the Scottish Government, but very limited access with the UK government. They haven't really been interested in meeting with us or really the TUC for that matter. Um, but I think where we are at the minute is still in a process of kind of ad hoc meetings where we do kind of meet up to discuss certain issues and take the temperature of where things are. But what we would be interested in going forward is really the creation of more formal structures and a more formal role for civil society to play in the negotiation process. So we would like to see that really at UK level and at Scottish government level because I think it is very important that we do have a discussion about how society is shaped, where power lies, how we deal with a lot of the, the very difficult issues that are going to arise um, because of Brexit. And I do think that there needs to be formal processes around that. And I think there needs to be a role for civil society and actors like COSLA and local government within that. OK. I just, um, my deputy, you know, almost certainly will come back on that, but I did promise to take a, a good point you, you <coughs> made formally in a second. Yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks very, uh, very much, uh, convener. I mean, that's quite interesting, you know, the, 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 the different experiences between STUC and COSLA. I mean, because... I'm intrigued that I, uh, I actually, I'm not supposed to call you David, I was told by the way. I've got to call you Councillor O'Neill sorry, apparently from now on, so sorry, David. I should point out it wasn't the convener that said you must refer to you as Councillor O'Neill. Um, but in, in paragraph 30 of your submission, it says, as a recent controversy with TT, 
at IP shows um, TTIP. Any trade agreement that touches upon local service provision requires to be negotiated with input and expertise of local government. This is not the case at the moment. And then, in, previous to that, in paragraph 14, you said one of its key international agreements is a chart of local self-government, which the UK and Scottish Parliament's governments are bound to implement, but have failed to do so, unlike most European countries. The current negotiations to repatriate powers from the EU thus represent or present an opportunity to finally address this. Why is it you think when the, when the, the UK government, and certainly in terms of that, that paragraph 14 to a lesser extent, the Scottish government, are not, have never really been keen to speak to COSL about such issues as TTIP, that they're suddenly very keen to to speak to you, whereas they haven't really been interested in negotiating with some of these key issues before? Councillor yeah. O'Neill. On, on the basis that President-elect Trump's probably going to kick TTIP into the, into the dustbin, uh, we all await to see what the outcome of that's, that, that's going to actually <coughs> be. In terms of the... Uh, the Convention on Local uh, Self-Governance. We have discussed this with the Scottish Government on many occasions. It's been an ask of, of local government. Uh, we are unique uh, in Europe, within the UK and in, in Scotland, that uh, we haven't signed up, up for that, that convention or haven't Im implemented it. The argument that the Scottish Government have ev always given us was that... Uh, that would require uh, independence under a written constitution, which would em embed local government within the, the constitution. Uh, our argument was that uh, if you put it into legislation uh, that, that you signed up for for that convention, it would require legislation to, to overturn that, and it would have to be uh, an actual thought-out process to do that. Uh, but the government said that could happen quite easily uh, and have just steadfastly refused to sign up for it. Uh, however, remains an ask of local government. Aye, but the point I was asking was why suddenly the UK government really keen to talk to you when they haven't been over issues like TTIP and the, and the Charter of Local Self-Government and they're clearly not particularly interested in speaking to the STC and, a, and TUC. What, what, why is it you think they're suddenly wanting to speak to COSLA? Because the Scottish government doesn't seem to be having that great a, a time of it uh, in terms of negotiating with the UK government at this point. I must admit, I wouldn't know why they're not keen in speaking to the STUC. I mean, I, I share the, the, the concerns uh, that they, they ought to be uh, doing that. Perhaps the, the fact that COSL is approaching this with the other three local government associations, uh, the attitude that, that, that we're expressing uh, is that we are where we are with, with Brexit. How do we make the best of this? Uh, get into almost with a positive light, despite the fact that COSLA was unanimously for Remain. Uh, but as I say, we are where we are. Uh, perhaps that's making a difference. I, I suspect it's more to do with the fact that the four of us are working together. OK, thanks. OK. I'll leave it for just now, because I want to come in on a different topic later, could you? OK, Elaine Smith. Thanks, Convener. But just on that final point, because um, it was, was something that I wanted to talk about later as well, um, Councillor Neil, you say that, it's, that we're the only EU member state without the constitutional protection for local democracy, but would that be a reserved issue? Because you do go on later to say that um, the UK and Scotland, but is it the UK that would have to have taken the decision to implement that? Can we just clarify, or could Scotland do it separately? My understanding is that Scotland could do it separately. OK, thanks. I think I, I, I would like both of them to do it. Though. Yeah, but I think it was quite. It was important to clarify that because I don't think that was clear in the paper or from the discussion. But could I also ask Helen Martin, um, you mentioned uh, the involvement of uh, civic society and obviously you specifically talked about the TUC not being engaged at, at UK level or the STUC, but what do you mean by wider civic society and how would you envisage that happening? Are you talking about some kind of committee or how would you envisage it? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I don't pretend I've got a really worked up answer for this, but I do think it's important that when we go through a negotiation process that there isn't just the UK government sitting talking to um, you know, countries in Europe and having a closed door negotiation when we don't know the direction of travel, we don't know what's likely to happen, we don't know what's going to come out the other side. I would hope that we could have some sort of discussion, some sort of um, constitutional convention, if you will, about how it is that we bring these powers back to 
the UK, what the shape of um, our country looks like going forward, the shape of trade deals in other places, you know, and the, there is a role for different levels of society within that. So local government is one, trade unions are another, but there could equally be churches, community groups. I mean, there's a whole there's a whole range of ways in which you can consult and engage people. But I do think it is important that this process is transparent, and I also think it's important that there is buy-in from communities and that there is an attempt to help people understand the decisions that are being made in the direction of travel that we are going in. It is not good enough that it becomes a black box and then you're presented with a final answer. I, I just don't think that that's healthy, I don't think it's democratic, and I don't think it would lead to good outcomes. Well, if Article 50 is going to be triggered... Um, at some point early in the new year, then is that something that you would you, you might suggest that the Scottish Government should be taking on board to, to lead the way in Scotland at the moment? Whether or not it's happening at a UK level, could it happen at a Scottish level in the meantime? Absolutely, because I would envisage actually, and it was remiss of me not to mention it before, that the Scottish Government should have a key role in this process too, and the other devolved governments as well, because they're a key actor in in, in our democracy, and that the Scottish government's position should be informed by the views of Scottish people and different layers of government within Scotland and different civil society actors within Scotland, and that that should actually help the voices of Scottish people be heard within within this wider debate, and I think I think that is important. Okay, thank you. Did Professor Mitchell, do you want to add? Yeah, to I would like to come back to the constitutional question because I think. Um, um, I think perhaps using the term in different ways uh, around this table, if you mean constitutional entrenchment, that is the right embodied in a, in, a, in, a, in a primary law which cannot be affected by just normal law, then clearly there's not got anything the Scottish Government can do, nor indeed the Westminster Government can do without a formal written constitution. The Scottish Government could pass, the Scottish Parliament rather, could pass a law which gave local authorities a great deal of power, um, more power than it has at present. I would be an advocate of that, but it can't really entrench that. It has no entrenchment powers. Equally, the UK Parliament doesn't have entrenchment powers. I don't think Brexit affects that in any way whatsoever. I must remember that formally the Constitution is a reserved matter. Okay, thank you. Before we move on to the next question, any other witnesses want to add anything to that? Okay, uh, Ruth McGuire. Thank you, convener. Good morning, everyone. Um, we've been debating. Um, migration in the chamber this week. So I'd be quite interested to hear <clears throat> the panel's views on freedom of movement um, and how restriction or the ending of freedom of movement will impact on local government. Um, I suppose specifically um, around um, skill shortages and how we might address that. Um, yeah, and, and growing our economy, these, these types of things. Okay, um, Councillor O'Neill. I think there has been a marked uh, difference in, in attitude uh, north and south of the border about, about free movement and about growing the population. Uh, anyone who uh, makes use of the hospitality industry will be, be very much aware of the number of uh, people from out with the UK that, that, that work in that, within our health services, the number of people uh, from out with the, the UK uh, is, is, is critical. Child care uh, and an awful lot of, uh, of care workers are people from, from out with the, the, the UK. If we lose the ability uh, to have these people coming into, into Scotland, that is going to be a real big problem for us. Uh, and industry uh, certainly seems to be uh, making that point. Uh, in the, the east of Scotland, uh, the fruit growing areas, uh, they, they rely very heavily on, on people from out with the UK coming in. It would be a real problem for, for the whole Scottish economy and, and uh, the wider UK economy if that freedom of movement stops. OK, thank you. Stuart Black? Yes, I think if you look at um, population statistics for Highlands and Islands, most of the growth has been driven by migration, and a lot of that's come from Eastern Europe. Just some figures I've got for you. Around 23% uh, of businesses in the Highlands and Islands area have EU employees, and so non-UK non employees. Um, if you look at uh, Scotland as a whole, in the tourism sector, um, statistics there show that 24% uh, of employees in hotels and 30% in restaurants are migrant workers. So it's a huge impact on the tourism sector. And that, of course, is our biggest industry in um, Highlands and Islands. I think also uh, the care sector is, is another one that's going to be um, impacted. And also some of our food and fish processing industries, these are heavily reliant on um, EU nationals. So it does pose a, a number of challenges. 
There are also very high skilled um, EU migrants working in life sciences businesses such as LifeScan in Inverness, which is uh, an R&D company, and also of course in the NHS. And in my own uh, department in the council, we actually lost a number of EU migrants fo following the referendum result who said that they didn't feel welcome and they, they left. So it is going to have a big impact and it's already having an impact. Okay, thank you. Helen Martin. Yes, I think this is an area where our members are feeling increasingly anxious. We have um, quite a high number of EU nationals in membership of trade unions and we're seeing um, more and more requests from those nationals about how they secure their status going forward. Um, so questions about whether they should be applying for citizenship at this point to make sure that they, that they can maintain their ability to live and work here. Um, we we, we find that quite disturbing because I think it shows that some of the reassurances that have been given by the Scottish Government in particular are not necessarily um, act, acting as genuine reassurances for, for workers and that kind of uh, insecurity is kind of maintaining within, within the population. I think in terms of local government, one of the key areas that's at risk is social care provision. There are a, a lot of um, foreign nationals working in social care generally um, and I think there are uh, it is particularly at risk of people potentially not being able to fill the roles if uh, we don't have access to EU labour. I think going forward in terms of migration, we are going to have to consider as a society if freedom of movement is removed, and we would hope that it isn't, but if it is, um, what we do to help the sorts of industries that have just been mentioned. Um, because right now the points-based system offers no option for low-skilled migration. And that doesn't seem like a sustainable position going forward, given the needs of certain industries and the fact that it, it is very difficult to fill uh, you know, seasonal work in agriculture, for example. Um, I think we would need to have have to reconsider how our immigration works to allow low-skilled workers through if we are going to have a complete sensation of um, free movement of people. Okay, I'll take Jim Savage, then Professor Mitchell. Thank you, convener. I'd echo the points my colleagues have made and add two extra points as well. The first one, I think, is to focus on higher education as well and some of the challenges they may face in terms of being able to uh, secure and attract international students and also staff in terms <coughs> of their long-term plans. And I think some of the concerns they've expressed quite clearly about some of the inhibition and maybe there. I'd also link the point of migration and immigration back through to the uh, discussion on structural funds. So my understanding is that a lot of the economic growth we've had in recent years has been based on migration and migration, not on productivity increases. If we are going to uh, restrict and inhibit the uh, influx of uh, population coming into Scotland, and at the same time there's questions in terms of structural funds which are there to support youth employment, employability, business support, the questioning comes about how we're going to actually support our uh, sort of a... Uh, existing workforce and community to be able to increase productivity to increase economic growth as well and it feels as though we could end up actually impacting on two sides of the uh, uh, the agenda which would have a negative economic impact so we really need to choose in terms of actually do we want to sustain and increase migration or do you want to sustain and increase investment into our existing communities to increase their productivity okay thank you professor mitchell i wonder whether we should put the migration issue into its broader context of citizenship rights, EU citizenship has been a developing concept and that covers a, per, a panoply of, 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 of rights um, which includes free move, freedom of movement which is vitally important for the reasons that have been articulated but also access to services. There's another very important point and that is um, voting rights. EU citizens have right to vote local elections. Will that continue to be the case? So I think it's best to try to broaden this out and to conceive of it in terms of the citizenship rights is it possible to conceive of um, changes and the loss of some rights that currently exist for citizens while others would be maintained? Some of these decisions are in the gift of this parliament, can be decided by this parliament, um, some by UK parliament, but I do think it would be best to, to broaden this out. Um, freedom of movement is, is fundamental, but you can have freedom of movement, but with very limited rights, the kind of notion of gastarbeiter and so on and so forth, which the EU has fought very hard against. I think it would be very worrying if we simply allowed migrant workers to come here, but to have limited citizenship rights. Okay, so do you want to follow that? Yeah, thank you for those answers. I suppose first off, I want to say this, just beyond sad to hear of people leaving because they don't, they don't feel welcome. But um, taking on board what you've said about citizenship rights as well, though, I'd, I'd like to ask um, Councillor O'Neill, um, 
if COSLA are planning that, that you know this is going ahead and involved, what planning have have they done, or have you done any work about? I suppose thinking specifically about the care sector, where we know there are lots of um, workers from elsewhere working with us. How how those gaps would, might be plugged if if, if these people left? Uh, there will be a lot of that work going on at individual local authority uh, level. I mean, what the earlier session was talking about long-term financial planning, long-term workforce planning, uh, but they will be at a relatively early stage with that uh, because, like everyone else, we were taken by surprise with the result of the sure. referendum. Maybe the lesson is don't have referendums. <laughs> We might not get uh, unity in that particular <laughs> suggestion. I thought so. The council to deal, but Mr. Savage is a local. Let's skip on the very last point and come back to the bonds on scenarios, <laughs> if I may. Um, I certainly, just to illustrate, I've been active involved in a conversation myself in my authority area in the northeast uh, this week, uh, involving the local authorities, involving the chamber of commerce, involving the uh, local college and universities in terms of how we develop clearer pathways to employment uh, uh, from a career point of view and into care and also into uh, sort of a, a early years and childcare. So really clear understanding that there is a, a, a gap in terms of provision, in terms of workforce there, and a very joined up approach in terms of looking about how we do it. It reinforces my early point that actually we can develop those scenarios, but we also need certainty in terms of funding, be it European, sort of UK or national, to be able to have confidence and assurance to then invest in terms of implementing those changes from a joined up sector as well. Uh, Helen Martin, yes. Um, I think just on this point, I think it it is important to think about what the opportunity is as well here, because if we are leaving the European Union, then we should be able to use procurement in a way to improve work, workforce standards, and um, particularly in social care, and drive up terms and conditions for staff, which I think should actually help attract people into the sector and keep a sustainable workforce, because at present, the way social care functions is just, it's it's simply unacceptable and there needs to be a drive for the for the living wage and good quality terms and conditions and perhaps there'll be more tools to do that in the future okay thank you sure black did you want to come in because you you're uh, i forgot your, your your other existence other highland islands european partnership your developed director of development and infrastructure at highland council so has your local authority done some of the planning work that i think ruth mcguire quite I think very about. similar to what Mr Savage was outlining, we've done some work with our community <coughs> planning partners, um, which include NHS Highland and UHI, so we have looked at this, it's a real challenge. I think other sectors that we haven't mentioned, construction is another one, so we, we also have a city region deal, as, as does Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire, with significant construction work, um, and already works occurring on projects like the A9, um, so there is a big concern about this. I think in terms of some of our remoter communities, um, migrant labour has been really important to these communities and there's a dearth of young people so it would be in many instances a requirement to attract young people from elsewhere in Scotland to go and live in those communities to sustain some of these uh, facilities that have been talked about and that again poses a challenge when we've got a, a shifting demographic towards an older population. Okay, thank you. Ruth McGuire, do you want to come back and some of that? Uh, no, thank you for those answers. Um, can I just, I'm going to take you in next, Mr Reitman. Can I just point out that um, I didn't know this, but the clerk will hopefully inform me that the European Committee is taking evidence uh, tomorrow morning on citizenship rights of European citizens within Scotland, looking at it in the round, Professor Mitchell, which I think is something we would, we would all welcome. But I, I'm just also just wondering, Councillor Neil, because the more I hear the discussions going on, the more it seems oh, frustrating would be the most uh, mild way of putting it, that there's quite detailed discussions with COSLA and other local authority partners on the UK level with the UK Brexit Minister, but STUC really not so much in the context of citizenship and rights and the Scottish Government also not so much. Do we have to maybe just kind of reconfigure the debate a little bit and I, I, I don't I hate the platitudes that little Theresa me about a red, white and blue Brexit and all that so when I talk about Team Scotland I really don't mean it as a platitude, I mean it as a coordinated civic and governmental approach to what Brexit looks like in Scotland. Do we have to do more of that and reconfigure our approach and what Councillor O'Neill I've name checked you so I'm interested in your thoughts in relation to that um, but also the other witnesses as well. I think that the concept of Team Scotland is a good one, but so is the concept of Team UK a good one. That's where the primary negotiations are, are going to be, be taking place. Uh, I think, uh, perhaps thinking about it a wee bit more, 
uh, perhaps part of the reason also that, that we are having a better degree of success than the likes of the STUC, not only working with uh, the other three associations, but we are working very closely with David Mundell uh, and, and, and his office, and, and we are getting a, a very good service from, from there. And there, there. There might be some benefit in uh, trying that route. Right. <coughs> but, uh, just before I like, because the point I was making would, would not be uh, COSLA going to David Mundell to get success or STUC going to David Team Mundell Scotland. to get to, right. to get access. I think what I'm talking about is a coordinated approach where, where where all the civic and political representatives, where there is consensus, go forward together to put the strongest case that there can be for society in in Scotland, Councillor O'Neill. And I'd be slightly worried about uh, individual groups, including COSLA, being picked off one by one, Councillor O'Neill, by, by a UK government where there's maybe not that much trust from much of Civic Scotland or Political Scotland. So, again, maybe another... I'll bring others in. Maybe you can come back to that at the end, Councillor O'Neill, about the idea of uh, one group being picked off over another group. Uh, Helen Martin, what, what, what's your thoughts on well, that? Well, I think, I think the key here is we want to... I said I wasn't talking about yourself, Mr Simpson. Um, Helen Martin. Um, I think the key here is that we we want to get the best outcome for for people in Scotland, and we want to get the best economic success that we can for our businesses, and um, we want to maintain people's rights. Um, and we would be interested in anything that helps us do that. I mean, we would absolutely participate in any kind of Team Scotland approach that the Scottish government was. Right. Presenting and I see we think Helen Martin, forget I said Team Scotland. It sounds like a platitude. That's I know, not, that's I know not what you, the point I was I know what you mean. A more coordinated approach. A, a coordinated approach from Scotland. We would be more than happy to participate in that. We would hope that you would want to hear the voices of workers in any such approach, and we would be happy to supply that. Um, I don't think that that would preclude any work that we were doing elsewhere. We would mm. still make direct approaches to the UK government, we would still work with the TUC, we would still want to do things with the Irish Congress of Trade Unions as well. We would we would continue our work in lots of different areas because our main aim is to try and defend the rights of Scottish workers and we will use whatever tool we can to do that, but we would be more than happy to support the Scottish Government's work. Okay, so just about the question is more about a more coordinated approach at a Scottish level, or if any other witnesses have got any reflections on that before we move to our next question. I will take you back in at the end. Councillor O'Neill, uh, Mr Savage. Convener, just to, to uh, observe, I think from a solace point of view, we have a good dialogue with uh, civil servants, uh, very effective both on the UK and a Scottish level, and very keen for that to continue okay. on. A coordinated approach would be very welcomed. Okay. Sure, Mike. I think another group that haven't been mentioned is the third sector. Often, um, in terms of the European Social Fund in particular, it's voluntary organisations and social economy organisations that are delivering those projects on behalf of local government. So I think that's an important grouping that we need to be considered. And they're represented on the, the programme management committee that I sit on, uh, monitoring committee, sorry. And they, they're regularly looking for more input to this process. Okay, if there's no other reflections, I'll, Councillor, I'll give you the last word on this and move to the next question. Uh, I am also a trade unionist, a uh, member of a uh, community. Uh, spheres of government don't have a monopoly in good ideas. Should we be engaging with others? Absolutely. Would it be a good idea to do it in a coordinated way? Absolutely. Okay, it's a good way to end that particular line of questioning. Uh, Mr Whiteman. Uh, thank you, um, Convener. I want to ask a question about EU uh, legislation, but before I do that, I just wanted a point of clarification from Councillor O'Neill in regard to the uh, European Charter of Local Self-Government. I mean, there's one question around um, um, implementing a provision of that, which to, is to recognise local government in the Constitution, and that there are issues around that, and that's been dealt with. But when you talk about transposing, are you talking about incorporating it into Scots law such that that treaty becomes justiciable in Scotland? Yes. Okay, yes. that's useful to clarify. Um, on EU uh, legislation, you make a number of points um, uh, in, in, in the COSLA paper, uh, and Professor Mitchell refers to these as well, around European legislation, which is now very extensive, of course, in regard to environmental protections, uh, consumer protection, trading standards, how much noise lawnmowers make, uh, etc. Um, and you're clearly concerned about them because they do provide, a, uh, I think, widely regarded in broad terms as a net benefit to, to consumers and society to have these standards. But to the extent that EU legislation and the observance of it is a requirement of being a member of the single market, um, the extent to which we have access to our, our members of the single market will determine the extent to which we have flexibility 
about amending any EU legislation in those fields, will it not? Professor, I, only because I saw Professor Mitchell nodding yeah. his head first. Yes, I mean, I think one of the, 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 the one likely or possible outcome of negotiations is that um, we will continue, if you like, to shadow EU regulations and law. I mean, that happens. Norway does that. I mean, much of Norwegian law outside the EU essentially follows EU law, not least because they want to sell their goods and services. If we are manufacturing goods and services and we want to sell it in the rest of the EU, we will have to abide by EU laws and regulations. There's also the other part that you mentioned, that some of these are very attractive. And I think in terms of just following good practice, we'll want to keep an eye on what's happening in the EU. One of the things that the EU has offered um, is one of these things that, in a sense, we, we kind of take for granted it's immeasurable, and that is uh, as, a, as a policy transfer field. We, we learn and we get best policy. Some of it isn't good policy. Some of it we would want to change, but there's no doubt at all about that. I mean, a lot of this will come down to, and I think that's the... the the number of the question, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm understanding it correctly, is uh, the question of our relationship with the single market. Um, I, I do tend to think that hard, soft Brexit are, are over, overly simplify the situation. Um, but I do think there's no doubt that, that uh, yeah, we'll, 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 I, I find it very difficult to believe we would not be continuing to follow EU rules. The one problem is, of course, we won't have a voice. We won't have a voice in any of that if we're outside it. We'll have to follow it if we want to sell, sell our goods and services, whether we're in the single market or not, frankly. OK, Councillor Neil, do you want to add to that? Uh, I, I agree wholeheartedly with, with the Professor. He's, he's said it much more eloquently than I, I could. However, being a politician, I can't help but have a sound bite. Uh, <laughs> uh, this must not become a race to the bottom. And being a politician, I'm going to resist the temptation of asking more about that. Uh, Mr Whiteman, it's your Just line of question. Briefly, uh, yes, I mean, uh, uh, from a local government perspective, with the duties that local government has on, on trading standards, uh, environment and all the rest of it, and with broader um, legislative requirements around, for example, procurement, is there a line to be drawn um, between those EU regulations and laws that are mandatory in terms of if you wish to have access and or membership of the single market and those which are not. I'm thinking, for example, of procurement. If we were, a, a, let's say, continue to be a member of the single market, um, would we able, be able to change our procurement legislation to, for example, try and enhance and support local economies more? Or would that be in breach? Because it's not about arguably selling things, or arguably it is, it's about buying things so others are selling to us. Okay, who would like to respond I, to that, Councillor Neil? I can tell you what local government's ambition would be as to whether we can actually achieve it or not, uh, I don't know. Uh, but localism should mean that through procurement we could do more uh, in the way of local purchasing. Some of us sitting round about this, this table are old enough to remember the days of when the Clyde used to build the, the world's ships. It builds very few ships now. Calmac's fleet by and large comes from, from abroad. Our fishery protection vessels come from from abroad, should we be able to do something about local procurement for our, our industries to help local business? Uh, we have an ambition that that is the case as to whether it can be achieved or not. I don't know. Okay. And our thoughts and opportunities, Professor Mitchell? Yeah, I mean, I think one has to go back to the origins of the single market and the debates leading up to 1992. And the, it was conceived of, and it con continues to be conceived of, as a, as a, as a as trying to achieve a level playing field. And I think if you were to um, change that and to advantage the UK, as perceived by EU27, you would be in difficulty. In other words, if we thought we could amend the uh, procurement regulations or any others in a way that might make it cheaper, easier to sell inside the single market, that would be objected to. I think one of the things that I find slightly odd about much of the debate post referendum on Brexit is the assumption in the UK that it's a decision for us. This is a negotiation that EU 27 will all have, each individually will have a vote and a say in this, and their interests will have to be taken into account. And I think it's important to try and understand how would they respond to um, a requirement, a demand, a request, whatever, because it's really only a request, for giving the UK some advantage. It's just a non-starter. 
So I suspect we will be in a position where we will continue, if we want to have access to that single market, to follow current um, single market rules and regulations without the voice into the future. Uh, that would be my take on it. Ellen Martin, did you want to come in any of that? Yeah, I mean, I think this is this is really the crux of the debate. Like, how, what are we going to negotiate? How much wiggle room are we going to have for the acquis communautaire? And um, I think there is a real politique here. And there are moments when that will work against us, and you cite one, which is procurement, but there are equally times when it might potentially protect workers. And I'm thinking about you know all the workers' rights that, that come from Europe. Um, I think questions of the status of the ECJ are very interesting, uh, whether or not we'll have to uh, abide by their rulings, what the what the mechanism will be for enforcement within the within the with the UK will we model and have our own court like EFTA does? Will it be more like what Switzerland does? Um, how, how will that work? And I think that's very important, and it's very important for us as trade unionists because the ability to take cases to the ECJ and the fact that UK courts have to follow ECJ rulings um, is very, very important for defending workers' rights and keeping progress going. So questions of how that system actually works in practice are extremely important. Any other witnesses have a comment to make on that, Mr Savage? I think if I could, uh, uh, two observations. Looking at the whole legislative framework uh, that we may have to work through to decide whether to stay or to change what we have, I think it's going to be a very complex task. And uh, my uh, thought would be one of uh, thinking about the unintended consequences <coughs> one have in terms of making sometimes simplistic choices about it. I use procurement to illustrate it. Many authorities have got a very strong focus in terms of wanting to procure as locally as possible <coughs> to stimulate their local economy. It's a well-worn uh, path to go on. But at the same time as wanting to support those local businesses, we also want them to, by buying locally, we want them to be successful nationally and internationally as well, which means they have to compete in someone else's turf as well. So if we start closing down things too much, we potentially inhibit the ability for companies to grow as well. And that's what I think is a spectrum we have to work on. And um, we use social clauses very extensively to try to encourage businesses to look to invest in local supply chain, apprenticeships, etc. If you make an absolute whereby you will only buy from local companies, then my question is about how that starts to have an effect on the supply chain, which you may not intend to as well. We do want to encourage say, companies to be able to be successful nationally and internationally, and not just out width of uh, local authority spending, but just in companies wanting to trade in their own rights in other markets as well. So I think some thoughts around sort of where we wish to get to there are interesting. I'd make a final point linking to state aid. If uh, I think we start to intervene uh, with Within legislation, the way that it starts to uh, sort of see the hand of the public sector come in to sort of uh, determine it to take more in terms of how we expect companies to do business, that may also impact the extent to which uh, private sector starts to expect the public sector to pick up the bill for investment in infrastructure and growth rather than what state aid tries to encourage, which is more balanced economy, whereby there's a balance of public and private investment going on as well. So part of the unintended consequence of choosing local could be a pressure on the public sector purse to have to pick up more of the tab compared to that we do at the moment. Yeah, Mr. Black? Yeah, so it's actually the state aid point I was going to raise, and, it, and just as highlighted in issues around, for example, very local transport services in, in parts of the remoter parts of the highlands or, or ferry services to the islands, um, things like community buyouts have also been affected by state aid. So there's a range of things that sit alongside procurement and state aid that I think need careful examination. Okay, thank you. A follow-up on that, Mr. Waker? That's great. Supplementary from Elaine Smith? Actually, convener, I think uh, most of it's been covered because it was a, I was actually wanting to ask about what opportunities there might be specifically given that Councillor uh, O'Neill had mentioned the use of local provisions. But could I just um, maybe ask Stuart Black what his view would be then on, you mentioned ferries. So on an issue like CalMac, for example, Scottish Government have um, made the point, it's been disputed in some ways, but they made the point that that um, it was European legislation that was meaning that it had to be tendered. So would you see an advantage moving forward that that might be something that wouldn't have to be done in future? Well, I guess, I guess that's for uh, um, government to decide in terms of the legislation going forward. But certainly state aid does tend to get involved in very micro things. Uh, I've got examples of small community organisations uh, running cafes and restaurants and things like that where state aid can come into play. So I think... There's a range of opportunities to look at some of these things and think, are they proportionate? Can they be changed? Is there scope for more flexibility around them? Just as we would like to look at procurement. 
So I suppose the point I'm trying to make is that there might be opportunities rather than just um, disadvantages. That's something that has to be considered. Mm -hmm. Kenny Gibson. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Um, first of all, I'd point out to uh, Councillor Neil that the two new ferries being built at, uh, by Calmark are being built in Port Glasgow, Fergus Marine, £97 million investment, 125 jobs preserved, 101 new jobs, and of course a £12.3 million Katrina went in service on the 26th of September. But I, I think you know uh, what we need to talk about basically is can we have our cake and eat it? And I think the answer is no. We can't possibly withdraw from the single market. We expect to have all the benefits of access to it. And I think that's the whole point of the, the single market. Now, at least two members of this committee are Brexiters. I'm not one of them. But there must be, for local government, some advantages, I would have thought, in terms of Brexit. And I wonder if um, colleagues can specify this procurement. I was going to go on, but colleagues have amply covered uh, the issues. I mean, Helen Martin, for example, has, has talked you know, about the, the potential to give real living wages. Uh, procurement has been touched on. But another area in paragraph 43 talks about the possibility of greater investment being made in the rural and coastal communities to increase their economic resilience in the face of uncertainties before us. So can, can people just talk about um, what possible advantages there could be? Because whether we like it or not, we're going forward in this regard. We look to see whether we can take anything positive uh, from it, although my own personal view is overall um, <laughs> voting, f uh, well, the UK voting to leave Scotland, voting to stay, of course, um, you know, creates more difficulties than it has resol will resolve. So irrespective of where uh, people stood on uh, yes. leave or remain, what are the opportunities that do present themselves just now that perhaps we haven't quite explored yet? Yeah, that's it. And that's Shell Yeah. There's a, an old okay, so term yeah. that used to be called a SWOT analysis, strength, weaknesses, opportunities and threats, and we should be engaging in that process right now. Have you engaged in that process? Well, I, yeah, I, I, yes. I, I don't I, think uh, Mr. Lo Gibson's local looked for a methodology. Government, local no. government is, is in the process right, of, okay. of doing that right now. Every, sorry, every, every threat is an opportunity. That's another slogan. At the end of the day, uh, I want you to know what the, where, where these specific opportunities lie. I think that's every threat is an opportunity. You can't have your cake and eat it. SWOT <laughs> analyses. But exactly. I think the, the substance of the question uh, was can we identify some of those? They might not, they might but went to a SWOT analysis and they, they don't fly, but what are the potential tender. opportunities? Let, let's put it that way. Does anyone want to maybe have a go at that? Professor Mitchell? I think one of the areas that is worth looking at um, is certainly procurement. I mean, uh, anyone who's um, done any work on that will be aware that there's a great deal of concern across public services in terms of procurement rules, and some of that is because of the EU. Um, I think it's possible to give a detailed answer on that at this stage, but it's certainly one of the areas I would begin to focus on. I think it's an area that you would have to be very careful in, as in all, and I think uh, Mr Sanchez's point is crucial, it's the unintended consequences of any uh, proposal uh, to, to, to alter uh, current, current uh, state of play. And also, uh, with respect to that, I think one of the things to be constantly aware of is the view of EU 27 because it may well work to the advantage locally, whether that locally is local authority level or lower, or indeed Scottish level or UK level, but it may mean that it is difficult to, to access EU. So I think, again, you know, the, the notion that we've left the EU is, is, is a misnomer. The EU is still there. It's still going to influence what we do. So take that into account as you move forward. The procurement to me is, given that there are so many concerns around procurement, an area that you need to go into in great detail. Um, there will be other areas, but that's the one that jumps out at me as a, an area where there's opportunities to, 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 to grasp. OK, uh, Mr Savage, yes? Maybe slightly parochial, but I think the opportunities may come forward on a sector-by-sector -sector basis as well. And clearly that's going to be a different picture across different parts of the country. And so from a northeast point of view, uh, looking at the uh, fishing industry at the moment, clearly negotiations going on overnight in terms of current quotas. Uh, but clearly sort of uh, that sector and that community voted in particular pattern, as we understand it, in terms of their views, in terms of Brexit. And we do envisage, and the, so they do envisage and see a more positive opportunity in terms of uh, Brexit, in terms that sector in terms of what the quotas may be in a broader sense again into the unintended consequences of huge dynamic yet to be worked through in terms of how the market may change completely but we do think from a business point of view it's going to be a sector by sector area by area point of view 
my, my, my second point of one of the, the upside in the opportunity, um, it's clearly stimulated a lot of thinking and consideration without being too simplistic about it, about what the different scenarios are, long-term plans are, that each area in each community needs to have and sharpen up at this point in time. So I thought I was sitting with the existing plans in terms of uh, school roles, uh, house building, uh, what services provide in the future, those are all now coming into sharp focus to, our, to get us to reappraise those and then what the different options may be as well. We may not have done that quite so diligently or as effectively without Brexit coming forward to actually stimulate that consideration now. So that has to be an upside. Okay, thank you. Helen Martin, did you want to come I mean, um I think it is right to think about the opportunities and um, from our point of view this is an opportunity to reshape our economy, to think about how it is that we give workers better protections in the workplace, how it is that we maybe redesign workplace democracy to ensure that uh, the workers' voice is heard better and that we get better outcomes in businesses. But I think there is, we have to be alive to the fact that there are a lot of challenges here. Um, you know, the economic figures don't post-Brexit aren't brilliant. It does look like we're going to have some economic problems. There is a, a whole spectrum of analysis and it is difficult to predict all the different scenarios that, that may play out. I think there is a clear direction of travel starting to form in terms of a kind of low tax, low regulation economy seems to be what the UK government's vision is. And we really would like to see the development of the UK economy in a different direction. And um, I think there is an opportunity there to have that debate, to think about the sort of economy that we live in, the sort of, um, the sort of rules that we put around business. Uh, but there's also a threat that we'll move backwards from even where we are. Thank you. Should like to want to come I in? think one example of uh, something that's happened quite recently is a uh, strengthening of our twinning of relationships with um, different parts of the world. So Augsburg in Germany, for example, is twinned with Inverness, and we had a delegation across from Augsburg looking at ways that we could work together in future. They were concerned about uh, what would happen post-Brexit, as were we, and that was a, a good example of something that's happened because of the, the impact of the vote. And they were particularly looking at the health sector, life sciences and tourism as industries we could develop stronger links between. Okay, thank you. Do you want to follow up on anyone? No, just to say it doesn't seem that there's a lot of upside for local government specifically anyway. I know everyone was looking for uh, straws here and there, but uh, in terms of local government, I didn't hear much. Okay, um, thank you. Graham Simpson. Yeah, um, just, just really following on from that, um, I, I do agree with you, uh, Helen Martin, that we, sh we should be looking at the opportunities. Um, you know, we're engaged in the process here. We've got to get the best out of it. Um, so I guess my question is, what is the best for local government in Scotland out of this process? We've covered procurement, but is there anything else? Any other powers that you think could flow from Europe to Scottish local government that would be to our benefit? First of all, we need to see what will flow to the UK, and we don't know that. I think one of the great challenges with uh, scenario planning is that we have no idea at this stage what's coming here, and so any scenario planning at this stage is uh, should be done, but it's very difficult when we may plan for something that's not going to happen. It really does depend on the outcome. I mean, and of course, I mean, up to point, I understand why UK government is not willing. To, to give a running commentary. Mm. You don't normally do that in negotiations. On the other hand, I think it would be good to have a sense of direction um, and a clear <coughs> sense of what the UK government wants. The problem is UK government is internally divided on this. But until we have clarity on that, it's going to be very difficult. But I do think we need to do it. It will maybe become clearer um, towards the end of next year. But um, until such time, I think it's, 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 it's very, very difficult to, 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 to look to the future in that way. And I always want to respond to that. Councillor O'Neill, did you want to add yeah. something? Uh, we need to keep to the front of our mind who we're trying to benefit here. Uh, and what I don't think we're trying to benefit is the structure of local government or the structure of the Scottish government or the UK government. It's communities, it's individuals that, that, that we're trying to benefit. So we need to make sure that whatever comes our way goes to the most appropriate place where it can have the most positive impact for communities and for individuals, not structures. Helen Marson. Um, 
I think a lot of the debates that we've had uh, around Brexit and, and even before potentially were about taking back control and about people having um, the ability to to influence decisions that affected them on a community level. I mean, some of the reasons why uh, my members who voted to leave did so was because they felt like decisions were taken all the way up here and they just they couldn't understand them, they couldn't see them come and they couldn't influence them. So um, what I would, what I think is a potential opportunity is that we can have a discussion about how it is that we make communities feel like they can influence the decisions and maybe reinvigorate um, local government and local democracy as, as part of this conversation as well because you know it, it isn't really necessarily a good outcome if we take back control but it sits at the UK government or sits at the Scottish Parliament and the community never sees it so I, I think there is an important, an important part about democrat democratisation and about hearing people's voices and giving people um, powers as a result of this change. Okay. Anyone else want to add to that? Uh, Mr Jim Savage. Yeah. I think we're just at the start of the consideration to your question. Uh, from my experience, people are looking at what the, the macro position is in terms of the effect of uh, uh, anticipated effect in terms of migration and economic changes. The ambition for communities has not changed in the midst of this whole debate. We're still wanting to have strong, vibrant, economically sustainable, well-looked-after, sort of flourishing communities across the whole country. The question is about what uh, and what we need to have in place to be able to achieve that has not changed either. Um, so take the example in terms of care, you know, I don't think that we have a list sitting here where these are the powers, as Councillor Neil said, that local government wants or needs to have. The outcome we need to achieve is a well-resourced supply chain and staffing cohort to be able to provide good care services for our communities in the way we need to. Quite how we do that is yet to be determined here. And it also comes back to the start of the conversation thing in terms of making sure we have a joined-up approach between all parts of the uh, institutions and society to say how do we best pull this off between us. So I don't, there isn't a list sitting there yet in two, to answer your question, so I understand it. Okay, do you want to follow up on any of that? Yeah, uh, um, Professor Mitchell, you're, you're right, we don't have a, a clear picture yet on what the UK government's ask is. Mm. But what I'm asking is what you think it should be I in, see. in terms of local government in Scotland. Well, in as much as I think coming back to the kind of... Um, idea of a, 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 an approach that brings in local authorities, Scottish Government and various other organisations, I think it's very important that there should be a clear um, consensus in Scotland that's articulated, and I think that's beginning to happen. Um, maybe it needs to be joined together more, but my sense is actually there's probably more common ground on, for example, the single market here in Scotland. Um, than elsewhere, and I think that voice needs to be heard loudly and clearly. I mean, I think it'd be really, uh, I'm going to say unfortunate, but that really doesn't capture my real feeling on this, but it would be um, unfortunate if we can't um, uh, find a way of, 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 of articulating that common voice, which seems to exist. Um, I mean, from my point of view, I would have thought that local authorities are uh, an ally for the Scottish Government in that. But in terms of that big wide debate on access to the single market, that's a voice that needs to be heard. And what will follow from that, well, uh, it depends on what, what, what uh, UK government thinks, but that's the voice that desperately needs to be heard loudly, clearly, and as far as possible in a unified way. We certainly know from past experience that, uh, and I'm talking really even pre-devolution, that when Scotland can unite, its voice is more likely to be heard. Um, that has been the history of Scottish politics over, uh, over decades, indeed centuries, and I think it would be uh, good if that, that was possible, especially given that it does sound as if there's not a great deal of difference on the broader picture. So I would hope that that could feed into it. And as I understand, that is what the Scottish Government is, is trying to do. Um, the council <coughs> that's been established um, looks to me to be an interesting example. It doesn't have local authority representation. It may well be worth raising that. Could there be a, an additional member, um, perhaps Councillor O'Neill? I don't know. Um, but that would be, uh, I think, symbolically important, but also lend weight to, to, to Scottish Government's current position or, 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 or with regard to these matters. Mr Simpson? What do you say to that, Councillor? <laughs> <laughs> we're, not, we're not having a three-week conversation. I believe it's no one at this table's job to offer that, so we, we, can, we can ask the question. We'll, we'll, we'll discuss that after this meeting, perhaps. Would you like to add anything substantive, Mr Simpson? Yes. He's just said yes. That's enough. Yes, excellent. <laughs> He's on that Team Scotland approach. Yeah. That's what I like to hear. 
Uh, Elaine Smith, you wanted to come so, in. Yeah, thanks, Convener. Um, and it's back again to the Team Scotland approach and the coordinated approach as a Convener. Thank I wish I'd never said Team it. Scotland, now Deputy um, Convener. But, but first, before I ask what I want to ask about that and it's relevant, I think I just would like to make the point that my colleague made the point on the record that uh, Scotland voted to remain was the quote. But I think that we have to be careful with that because, yes, the majority of people who voted in Scotland voted to remain, but not the majority of the population of Scotland. And there has to be some recognition of that. Um, certainly, I do it from a perspective, as, as Kenny pointed out, that I was um, I, someone who voted to leave from a Lexit point of view, a left exit point of view. So I make that, you know, I put that out there, obviously, that that was where I was coming from. But the reason I say that is that it, it wasn't just a Scotland-wide vote, you know, it was a UK vote. So if we come back to the whole issue of Team Scotland and um, the coordinated approach, then it can't just be up to the Scottish Government. We've been discussing whether or not the Scottish Government's been engaging with COSLA and how they have been engaging with um, the STUC. But any Team Scotland approach would have to include the UK Government, our Members of Parliament, not just the Scottish Government, but our Members of Parliament, the Secretary of State for Scotland, the civil servants in Scotland that work for the UK Government, and Civic Scotland. So I think that I would just like um, some opinion as we approach maybe the end of this session on that, because we have, I think, a tendency, we're in the Scottish Parliament, we're a Scottish Parliament committee, we're having a tendency to say, oh, what's the Scottish Government doing and who are the Scottish Government engaging with? But if it's a whole coordinated approach, given it was a UK vote, then I think a whole Scottish coordinated approach has to pull in much more than just the Scottish Government and Civic Scotland. And I see Professor Mitchell nodding. Can I, can I say yes, but one, one caveat to that, and I, and I think, you know, all in favour of democracy, participation and engagement and bring people in, this is going to be a fast-moving... Um, two-year um, exercise has got to be able to respond quickly and to get it out there. And one of the costs, one of the realities is that when you have public engagement, it slows the process down. So I'm not against it, but we should be willing to acknowledge that. That's why I would suggest it would be good to find consensus and as broad a range of uh, participants. And what I think is notable and why I've raised the, the possibility of COSLA's involvement is that science is if COSLA, in terms of the policy areas, is very much in, 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 in the same place as the Scottish Government, that's all. But um, I would be deeply concerned if we uh, simply kept adding to the list and adding to the list and we slowed the process down. That's not to disagree with the fundamental point you're making, but we need to be in a position where we can respond quickly. We've got very little time. Uh, the process, uh, we're told, is going to start early next year. It's a two-year process. We've got to move fast. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other thoughts, comments on it, Helen Martin? <laughs> yeah, um, with fear of adding to the list, um, <laughs> I think uh, one of the things that the Scottish Government should think about is who are our allies in Europe? and who might want to um, be, you know, responsive to the sorts of arguments and concerns that people in Scotland have within Europe. So, you know, from the STUC's point of view, we've already met with the ETUC um, to discuss the idea that actually defending workers' rights in the UK is not a UK interest. It is a, it is a European worker interest. And there must be ways in which we can break down issues like that at governmental level, and there might be allies in different parts of um, Europe that could support our positions from within the EU bloc. Um, in that way, it makes it less adversarial between the UK and, and versus the EU, and it, 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 helps, it helps that negotiation process. Okay. Anyone just want to add to that? Okay. Uh, could, Vina, could I just add, I would have thought that that's maybe what the Scottish Government were um, embarking on when they said at the beginning of the summer that it, the First Minister herself was talking across Europe to different organisations. But I think maybe the thing is, is that all being pulled together? I, I'm not mm -hmm. suggesting, you know, it was yourself, it's Helen Martin, who suggested Civic Scotland. Now, what that <coughs> would consist of, I, I don't know exactly. But... Perhaps what is needed is uh, people getting together in Scotland to get the feedback from that, to discuss it. And as Professor Mitchell says, that really needs to happen quickly. So somebody needs to take the lead on mm. taking that forward. But can I, but I'm interested to know what, how, how that would work and to make sure that we don't end up having a discussion that we should be having in private when we consider our evidence after this evidence session, but in relation to 
uh, what a Scottish approach would be, because it's not unreasonable to suggest that there may be a strong consensus in Scotland over what Scotland would like to see out of negotiations with EU27 uh, following Brexit and what that deal would look like. And that could be different from, say, David Mundell and the UK government. It's about trying to influence the terms of negotiation almost before they commence. So that then becomes difficult, of course, to have a, a Team UK approach to what could be a distinct Scottish view as expressed in the referendum. So any, any comments or observations you can make about how we get that, what I would consider to be a kind of unique Scottish approach to what will be UK negotiations and the structures around that would be very helpful. And at the end of the day, what we've all said is it's not just about the structures, it's about making sure that Civic Scotland and the people that we represent and all of you represent uh, get the best out of a uh, Brexit negotiation. So any additional reflections on that would be welcome before we tie up the end of this evidence section. Councillor O'Neill. One reflection in that would be that devolution has meant that we have four different systems in the UK. Uh, the Scottish Parliament is a very powerful devolved parliament. The, the Welsh Assembly uh, getting some additional powers, but it's a different set, set of competencies. In the Northern Ireland Assembly, different again than what remains in the UK. So it's, it's right and proper that we should be dealing with this, both in a UK and a devolved sense. And that's very helpful. Any other reflections before we kind of move towards the end of this evidence session? Professor Mitchell. I think I would say is that one of the reasons the Scottish Parliament was established was to be the voice of Scotland and to draw in from civic Scotland opinion. And in a sense, I'm tempted to throw this back at the Parliament, to you and other members of the Parliament, to find a way of doing that and to articulate that. We, we are not in a position to do, to do that, but the Parliament is. Um, obviously, the Parliament, as a, as a form of representative democracy, has a role here, but it has to acknowledge, and I think the Parliament's had a very good record since its establishment in drawing in voices, but perhaps, mm -hmm. I don't know, the Committee of Conveners could get together and find a forum, a means of uh, drawing on that. You're looking at this. You mentioned another committee's looking tomorrow. I think one of the dangers, and it's a danger I've often referred to with uh, parliaments, is that there's a lot of work gets done in silos, and committee silos, and somehow trying to bring that together and to articulate that common Scottish voice would be, would be, would be useful. OK, any additional comments? Um, Helen Martin, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I think, um, I think it's just good to remember that, um, yes, we want to pursue a Scottish coordinated approach, but that can be supported by other other parts of the UK, and you know the Northern Irish Assembly is an obvious ally, um, for, particularly on freedom of movement issues. Um, the TUC is an obvious ally as well, particularly around workers' rights. And um, you know there are there are way there are times when remembering other interests within the UK will make us stronger, and I think it's important to do that. I, I think that's very helpful. Stuart Black, did you want to add anything? Just, just a minor point about the regional dimension as well. The Highlands and Islands is an area that's benefited over a long time from European funds. So I think in an, in an attempt to gain voices across the country, we'd also make, need to make sure that we hear those voices from the north of Shetland, the west of Lewis, and, and places further afield than the central belt. Yeah, point well made. Mr. Mr. Savage, you're welcome to make some additional. Okay. okay. I think we are moving uh, towards the end of the evidence session. I, I think there's perhaps a, some comfort we, we, we can give Professor Mitchell and others that we are looking at this at various committees in the Scottish Parliament. Some of the things that we haven't raised here will be dealt with at, at other committees, but understandable, we've tried to focus as much as possible on, on local government, and we will take stock of the evidence we've heard today, and we'll hope to have a coordinated approach across the parliamentary committees. Thank you everyone for uh, giving evidence this morning and we now as previously agreed move into private session. Thank you.